Okay, so I still think EVAP is a valid way to go. There haven't been a huge amount of changes in EVAP over the last number of years, but there's a thought process that I put into this that I feel works. If you're teaching this, you're going to cut down a lot of diagnostic time for your students. It's not as hard. We make it up. Uh, there should be. If not, we can get some. We can grab. You can grab a chair from the next room. I don't think they have that many people in there across the you hall can or something. One from the door, if you want. That oh yeah, the one from the door. You can take. Door. It's all air conditioned. So, guys, I've always done this. I'm here to help you. I'm help help you make your job easier in teaching people. And I put it together in a way that, you, and many of you, I know. How many are teaching doing more than one prep? How many teaching multiple subjects? Yeah, you don't have the time. You know. 40 years ago at Skyline, we all decided we were going to specialize in our own areas. So does that mean I'm as good as you in your break area? Hell no. But my break instructor wasn't as good as I am in engine performance. But we just decided that was the way we were going to be. So I've tried to put my heart and soul in it so I can help you guys, especially when you don't have the time to do all. You've got to do it all. And that's why I put this stuff together for you to teach them. Okay? So when we get done with this, there'll be an email up there. You can email me. Uh, I can send you a PDF file stuff and I'll also show you some other things on this. I think we can get going. I think we're only going to have a couple more people coming in. Um, for you guys who don't know me, I'm Rick Escalombre. I taught at Skyline College for 31 years. We have one of the finest programs in the state of California and one of the largest. Um, I was fortunate, as I tell you here. Well, let me show you what I'm going to do today. Uh, then I'll get into it with a little bit of the course. I always call it a systematic approach to teaching. OBD2. Now, this uh, I'll tell you very honestly, I've taught this to many, many texts, and I took the word teaching out of it. Duh. I put when I'm doing the teachers, I'm putting in it to you as a word teaching, because that's what I'm approaching. You're teaching this to other students. It's the same stuff. We're gonna just brief. I pulled out of the course the UT007, some of the safety stuff, just a couple things related to it. There's a whole section on safety. Uh, also on um, evaporative emissions and why we're where we're at and how they do it in shed testing and things like that. Um, we're going to look at monitored readiness flags on these. I get so frustrated when I hear people say, oh, the EVAP monitor never runs. The hell it doesn't. There's a big portion of it that runs a lot. There's one part that doesn't run as much as it should. Uh, so some brief things on components. Most of you are beyond components, but just some high highlight reminders. And then the emphasis is going to be on testing. And the very last thing we do in our testing, the next to the last thing is smoke machine. We want to get away from the smoke machine. A lot of the diagnostics are well before that. Some of you have been up the skyline, and when we were, we were there, I, first of all, I put this into a course. We trained almost 5,800 smog techs during this course. Um, if you need to, you grab a chair from one of the other rooms, bring them in, feel free. Um, yeah, I think back in 2012, 13, that cycle between myself and ATG, we probably trained 90% of the people in the state for their update training. Well, EVAP over the years, 5,800 text abuses. And I have a simple theory on this whole thing that I always tell you. When I write a course, I write it for you. Think about courses that you've looked at possibly teaching and you've shied away from them because you weren't comfortable teaching that because you didn't create it. I'm just maybe I'm putting words in somebody's head or not, but I think that's what it is. My theory is I write it for you first. Because if you're not comfortable teaching it, it's going to be garbage to the students. So I want you to think about as you're going through this, could I work with this? Could I teach students from this? Yes, I have a world of knowledge, but is this organized in a way that I could effectively teach students? That's really the key. You've got the knowledge, you just need the order and some other things to highlight. Uh, Skyline, we had a fleet of, at that time, 80 OBD2 cars, four dynos, 10 ski map machines. I hustled the machines. I got, we had the dynos. And the dynos allowed me to do a lot of testing. And one thing we learned about EVAP, it's not load dependent. If you have a dyno, you can run EVAP monitors on the dyno without even putting a load on it. It's only speed dependent. We'll go through this as we go through. And the last thing is, when I started heavily on the EVAP, it was 2004, and uh, we went from a four-hour class to a 36-hour class just in EVAP. We had Toyota, Sports, Hondas, GMs, you name it. And uh, we had labs that incorporated all those cars. So UT007 has lab sheets to tailor to your cars 
your environment, but they're tests that you can apply to those different makes and models. Okay? But for you guys, I just, that's why I'm here. That's why I make the journey. I can literally tell you I'm here off my, uh, uh, my recovery recovery. About three and a half weeks ago, I gave up a kidney, and I'm feeling great, and I said, I'm getting down to the CAT conference, and nothing's going to stop me. <clears throat> okay, dropper emissions. Anyone remember when we started doing them? Yep. What year? 1971. First charcoal canister we had to have. We've come a long way from there. This was, some of you guys are going, well, I guess you say over the hill tonight? Is that over the hill? Or I don't mean age-wise. I'm talking about <laughs> distance. Isn't that what some of you grew up in? I remember flying in L.A. in the uh, early 80s, and my daughter saying, Dad, what's that down there? And I said, sweetheart, that's the air you breathe. Okay, and evaporative emissions were a big part of that. We know we're not working with a fully sealed system. We know we have an escape out the back door of fresh air, too, that we've got to consider because a lot of our problems start right there. We know that refueling the vehicle can create a problem. We know sitting in the sun can create a problem. We've got to address all of those. We've got to also understand that a 20,000 of an inch leak can put out almost 1.3 grams per mile, which is huge. It doesn't seem like much, but it's huge. And those standards are going to be coming down a little bit. But I still have not seen anything in the regulations that say 10 thousandths or zero thousandths for leaks. Okay? We're still working with the 20. And the bottom line here is I don't care about the size of the leak. If you are using the smoke machine and the ball ain't at the bottom when you're done and it's not standing there, you're not done. Forget it. So I'm going to solve your problem. This is a little video that's available to your car, but I like to show people this is an introductory. No audio on this except me. Watch what happens the next time you fill up your car. Depending on the car you have. If you've got some of the hybrids, you won't have this issue because you've got a secondary block out in there. How about that bacteria that lives, that black stuff that lives around the filler maker? Yeah. It's the same like those spiders. Settle them in there, yeah. No, that's hydro, those are hydrocarbons coming out when you take your gas cap off. No, no, no. I meant the black stuff. The black yeah, the moldy. It is moldy. Yeah, there's all the moisture and everything. Mm -hmm. But just to show you, you, know, you remember the days when you pulled the boot back to fill up the car? Absolutely. That was shutting off because some of the OR, ORV system wasn't working right? I just want you, I always like to start out with this and say, hey guys, this is what you're capturing. I'm going to do that for my motorcycle. Yeah. You got her. Hey, there's states that still don't, still don't have recovery systems that are bumps. I still say that. Gas is cheaper there too. Yeah. We're serious about hydrocarbons. One hydrocarbon anywhere is way too much. So I got this from the Air Resources, it's available through the Air Resources Board. And I just thought it was a, a real home run for introducing students to EVAP to show them, because they want to know why. You can tell them it's hydrocarbons, what is it? Well, you're seeing it right there. Clear as day. Now from here we'll go, let's see, we get there. Yeah, we're getting there. There's a few more little things on here, but I don't think I moved to that. No, we're getting there. Okay, let's move on. One of the things we got to work with, this is a chart I made up. Now, we could add pascals, we could add, add millibars, but that's a simple mathematic equation. This is what you are commonly seeing on scan tools. Uh, inches of water, I hate when they put it in PSI. And remember, when you see the unit value in EVAP, thank the engineer who designed the scan tool, because they're the one that assigned the unit value. If any of you remember the old MPSI, they were the only ones that I could go in and change unit value for the car up what I wanted. Otherwise, you've got to take whatever the scan tool manufacturer gave you. Inches of mercury, not a good measurement for eval. Millimeters of mercury, absolutely. Kilopascals, absolutely. And our global OD2, we're going to see later, is gone to pascals. Not a good unit to be using. This is a conversion chart to show you that on a typical car, you won't pull the system down any more than that number there if you're pulling the large leak test. And I'm going to I'm going to use some words I don't normally like to use, but I'm going to say large leak for now. So if you're looking at a scan tool, this is a starting point. Half a PSI, one PSI, and a good way to do this is show the students how small a number this really is, how little bit you're working with. Uh, when you're looking at your scan tool, you want to know key on engine off. Where am I at? Do I have a stuck vent? What am I really looking at? But we're going to take this, and remember this all comes from the, you guys remember yesterday, that were with me yesterday, I said, 
How does how does the PCM know what the cat's doing? O2s. Those are the reporting components. Well, we got the same thing in eval. When we first started teaching eval, I didn't emphasize that enough. But if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So we got to make sure the reporting component is right. So we've got to understand these numbers. And we got to understand: is it, are we working with a compound gauge or an absolute? Two different things. We'll be looking at those. This is just a little reminder that when you're working with EVAP, it is like water. It will evaporate, but faster. We want to get it to a point where it's stable. And this is why we don't test EVAP when it's dead cold. It's too dense. There's no vapor present. But at the same time, we don't want to test it when it's too volatile. Now, how do we know when it's too volatile? What's reporting? Let's just use a fuel tank pressure sensor. That voltage is translated to a volatility. That's how the PCM knows that the fuel is unstable. The other thing we don't, nobody tells you is if you, how many do Nissans? Anybody do Nissans? The Nissan has a fuel tank temperature sensor I'm going to show you. If you're above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you've got to suspend it because the fuel is unstable. So as we did yesterday, a little chemistry involved, a little physics involved. And then what we want to do, what we're doing in our eval system is that it's completely sealed. We bring the molecules to a state of equilibrium, which means our smoke machine is at the bottom. There's no leakage. It's as simple as that, okay? And again, temperature critical. We're going to want, on most eval systems, with one exception, a couple exceptions, we're going to want a cold start. We want to start from a stable state of equilibrium. We want to get it up to a moderate temperature, but not too hot a temperature. Okay? Okay, systems out there. And again, in California, we can't bury these old ones. I do a presentation like this in New York. They say 60, 96, 97? I don't think so. But we did start out with what we call a non-enhanced system. GM and Ford used them. There was no ready, there was a readiness flag, but there was no back door. I mean, no, excuse me, there was no readiness flag, no back door. All they could do was check for purge flow. No leak checks. You remember the, the GMs used to have a switch and you worked on those. Ford used the, the flow in the mass air, like a, a sensor in the purge line, like a mass air flow sensor. That's all it was, was do we have flow and when we shut it off, does it stop? Starting in 96 and required in 98, then we went to the full enhanced system, which means we can detect leak under pressure or vacuum. And I'm gonna show you these on running cars. We had a purge flow monitor, making sure the purge was flowing. Uh, they did have a readiness test. And then for you that weren't, haven't been in my class before, I'm going to just say a reminder what we did yesterday. Monitor test, make up flags. Flags are what pass or fail smocks. Okay? So please don't say you can't get the monitor. After today, even in the EVAP class we didn't do yesterday, you're not going to say I can't get the monitors to run. We'll show you where you're checking. If any of them run, you have run monitors, you just haven't flipped the flag for mission purposes. And obviously, we're going to take a look. We're going to take a look at some key off systems, and many of your systems today are key off with pump and without pump. Okay, real quick with uh, minor on uh, the main components. Purge solenoid. Every purge solenoid out there on an enhanced system is always normally closed. Okay, that means it's ungrounded, and it's got to be dewy cycled to be opened up. It's used for the purpose of creating an intake vacuum for purge flow but also during your eval test. We're going to show you how you can watch this on a scan tool. And how many of you do use snap one? Okay, Autel? Okay. You can use either one of them, they're great for this. The difference between the snap on and the Autel is you can get your recording out of the snap on in the shop stream in your computer and make handouts like I'm showing you here to show your students. The problem with Autel is you almost have to play it out through the HDMI port to a recording device to be able to capture everything, but you can't get the recording out of the unit. There's no way to transfer it out. Just a little teaching side of it. I always put this here, note, faulty purge can set a large leak code if it does not fully open or open at all. Remember, PCM only issues the command. It doesn't know that it worked. So the PCM will command it on. Go ahead. And a bird solenoid says small leak code? Yeah. You can't? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to... I'll show you in your visual inspection one of the things you're looking for that can cause that. It's not super obvious, but it's uh, it's something you want to look for. It's a pintle. Anything gets in there. 
if we keep it from seeking properly. Not as likely, but as possible, yes. And that's why I believe in pinch off fighters. So you can isolate things down. Some of the Japanese cars, remember, you, they'll refer from the VSVs, vacuum switching uh, valves. And this is one of the things we're going to show you later, stressing your issue. When canners just start to break up, charcoal granules get in the line, they get stuck in the purge, they're not going to see properly. Okay? And we'll see it, we'll show you an example of that. So the simple term here is this is the front door. It's a great way to teach it. Great way to teach it. It's the front door. The front door opens up. It's hooked to the engine. We pull a light, slight vacuum, very small vacuum under the tank. We're going to show this to you in, in uh, actual uh, vehicle operation. The vent is the back door. The vent door, and I say this in 99% of the cars, is normally open. It sits around. It sits around. It sits around. Is that a canister closed valve? Yeah, same thing as a canister closed valve on your Japanese cars. Vent solenoid, canister closed valve, same thing. This is on a Toyota. So it's a canister closed valve, but it's still a vent solenoid. Open to the atmosphere until you run the purge monitor. And again, I'm going to show you on the grafting tools how you can teach this and see it very easily. You'll know when the EVAP monitor is running. Here's the problem you run into. For some reason, CARB didn't require the vent solenoid as a pit. Some manufacturer, they don't, I can't, I don't know of a global OB2 CARB that will give it to the, the vent solenoid on the global side. On the OE side, there's some that will give it to you, some that won't. So you gotta know what you're looking at when you're grafting this to understand when things are happening. Only time the vent solenoid is commanded on is when the monitor test is running. And that monitor test could be commanded on after a refill. So it sees the fuel level rise, you start the car back up, it says, hey, there's just been a refill, I wanna make sure you didn't leave the cap off. And that's gonna test for a PO457. So you might see if you're grafting this, the scans will come on after a refill for a quick test. But that only set a code that didn't, it didn't hold pressure, the cap must be off. It's not doing a full leak check. This thing is susceptible to dirt waters. I'm going to show you in the visual inspections. And when you test them, as I'm going to remind you as you go through this, always exercise these. So when you're doing bi-directional testing, don't do them once or twice or three times. Do them five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times and make sure they are closing off. And we'll walk through this later on. And there's the fresh air hose that's connected to them. In some of the early days, the engineers weren't too smart where they put those. <laughs> ah, this is a Nissan. If you got a Nissan that you're gonna try and boat launch a boat from, you better not get the back end of that truck down into the water. Yeah. Because if that purge is operating, you're sucking water, okay? Um, some of those, not on the Nissan, but on the GMs, the vent kits were relocated because of this. There's going to be another issue. It says cobwebs. When you fill up, sometimes fill up your car and go fill the charcoal canister. It's warm. Well, guess what? The spider says, hmm, I don't know what that thing is, but I know it's warm, and I can get at it. So that's where they start climbing up in there because the temperature is rising when you fill up the granulated charcoal. And we're going to look at an example of that. Okay, we're going to backtrack a little bit because in California, we still got lots of these cars out there. Toyota in the early generation, we're going to talk about systems in a little bit. They use a middle solenoid, I like to call it, or a bypass solenoid. Basically, it's to split the system in half, and we'll show you how it does. Uh, it's normally closed off of battery bolts. PCM got it grounded. It's located between the fuel tank and the charcoal canister. The VP is the Japanese cars is your vapor pressure sensor, which is your FTP, okay? It's gonna allow you to measure tank pressure, canister vacuum. De and it talks about the surface de-energized, uh, the three-way uh, three VSP valve uh, is measuring canister. So I'm gonna show you these to you on my, on my vehicles, or recorded vehicles. When energized, the pressure sensor is reading the fuel tank. And I have diagrams and schematics so you can really visualize this. How many work with the older Toyota systems? How many people said, oh, it's just easier just throw a canister on it? <laughs> right? No need to. If it's a valve, yes. It's a solenoid, no. And I've got one I think you really like. And the middle solenoid, a lot of times, is not the easiest place to get it. So forget this crap about lap scoping and things like that. I'll have a case study on one that I'll show you that you actually can see it in the scan tool when you knew what you were looking for. 
what could have taken a while to diagnose took a matter of minutes. Remember yesterday's class for you who weren't new? It was called sitting on your butt. In the first 10 minutes, collecting a lot of data. Same thing with eval, collecting data initially. We're going to focus today on this one right here. But I'm going to remind you, as I said to you yesterday, and you that weren't with me yesterday, is we typically call these once per trip monitors, which means they can only go from incomplete to complete once per trip. But if they're failing, the PCM may run the test multiple times in the same key cycle. I'm going to show that to you on a Nissan in a little bit to show you how the PCM says, oh, I think we've got a failure here. You don't know, you're driving the car. But while you're driving it, it's taking a little longer, a little longer because it's running again and again. So hold on to that one, we'll come to that. So we start out, typically, EVAP, we always use the expression, well, it's not complete, but it's one of the ones on the list, and we know for smog purposes, we don't have to have a complete, okay? We do not have to have a complete, not a requirement. Okay, I hear a lot about basic criteria. Roberto, you were asking about basic criteria. Here's one for vacuum the case systems. And again, if you, on the pictures and stuff, I will, at the end of this, you're welcome to take them. I have no problem with it. But you can, you're going to be able to email me and I can send you a file when I get home. So if you want, pictures are fine. But if you, you want to just watch and listen, uh, you can you get the email at the end. That's the one you can take a picture of. Okay, so let's go to the vacuum decay system, which basically, even on your engine off systems without pumps, you're still using engine vacuum to pull the system down. There's a difference. I'm going to show you both systems between vacuum and vacuum decay. This is pretty universal, with a few exceptions on some manufacturers, but six to eight hour cold soak generally should get your EVAP, ECT, and IAT within 10 degrees of each other under 122 degrees, but generally it's going to be between 40 and 95, unless you're in the desert and something that you wouldn't be here in the summer where it never cools down. Uh, but that's one of the criteria. The reality is EVAP temperatures start up, in most cars got between 40 and 95. Okay? The other thing is when you're driving the car, this is what you want to avoid. If you're going to drive this to run the EVAP test, do not slosh the tank. Because what are you building up in the tank? Pressure. Pressure. What happens to volatility? Test suspended. Okay? Now I'm going to show you an example on a Nissan where you want to do that. It was harder to run the Nissans on a dyno than it was on the road because if you're getting your, your rear wheels on a Nissan or Infiniti bouncing on a dyno, do we have a problem? Yeah. Okay. Well, I need those bouncing to get the pressure in the tank to build up. Okay, because they have a temperature sensor that we're going to look at. Fuel level, pretty standard is quarter to three quarters. But I've seen them as low as 12 and a half to 87 and a half. But if you're teaching this, this is typically what you're looking at. And remember on this one, if you're doing a pre-can car, that means you're stuck looking at the gauge. So the question becomes, is the gauge correct? If you're on can, this is a pit that gives you the fuel level. Makes your job a lot easier, uh, more apt to believe. Typically, the vacuum uh, monitor part of it will run between 140 and 170 degrees. Remember, not stone cold because it's too dense, but not too hot to where it's volatile. And typically, in about a 40 to 50 mile an hour range, I've run them lower, but that's a good window. And this is the important part. This is why you can literally do it in your class with the wheels hanging on the, on the lift. Because it's not low detecting. It's only speed dependent. Speed and time. That will do it. Now we're going to split this into two systems here. So let's take a look here. Oops. We're the same thing. One more back. There we go. Before we go any further, we've got to take monitor tests. We've got to split them into two categories. Does anyone remember, does anyone remember yesterday what a parallel monitor is? Yeah. I showed you a video. Right, yeah. The O2 comes down, says, click, 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 fast pass, the cat's ready, but the O2's not done, let's go test the cat. Then we'll go back and finish the O2. EVAP is not that. EVAP is a series monitor. That mean, what's, what's it mean in a series circuit? Right behind each other. One, one, one at a time. time behind each other. You got to go one right after the other, right? If there's a break in the sequence, it's done. So at some point. So let's go with the old style with the car running. 
We do, I use the word gross, we're gonna change that. Small leak, very small leak, and then we vent the system. Boom, 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 boom. Those were easy to run, as long as the temperature and the fuel level were correct. Okay, but then we went to the key off systems. So what we did is we went to the gross, may or may not do the small here, and I'm gonna show you examples of that. We go to venting the system, make sure there's no restrictions, and I'm gonna break this down in the next slides. It has to be off for a minimum amount of time, then it does its small leak checks with the engine off. That's EONV. Some of you deal with Toyotas, you have a pump. Some of you deal with Subarus, you have a pump. Okay? Some of you deal with old BMWs, some Mazdas, uh, basically Bosch units, the DM, DMTLs, where they used a motor. And based on the speed of the motor and the amperage draw, they knew if there was a leak or not. But here's the key. This one runs quite frequently. This one, through step number three, runs quite frequently. So you shut the car off, what happens when you shut the car off? You just run in real quick to get something from the convenience store and you come back out. The test hasn't started yet, but it wanted to. Now the test is suspended. You will have populated all those things in mode six, but you will not have populated these, so guess what? That information is forgotten, but it's not used again. So the next time you start it up with conditions, you've got to do the whole list again. So where we get interrupted on EVAP a lot of times is right here. It gets interrupted with the key off, and again, we're going to talk about that. Okay, so this is a series monitor. Gets interrupted anywhere, you've got to start the whole thing over again. Where the parallel monitor that we did yesterday says, good, let's go do this, let's come back. And it says here, I didn't put the purge flow on there because the purge flow monitor and seal, purge flow monitor, which is seal, purge and seal, can happen before this or after this with the vehicle running. Okay, so here's the break, oops, man. Here's the breakdown of a vacuum decay monitor. Vacuum decay means we're gonna pull it down, and I like to explain it this way. The blood's in my arm right now. It's flowing here great, and I put a tourniquet on it. I squeeze it hard. If nothing comes out, I'm going to trap everything in there. Now I'm going to test if the leaks. Then I'm going to release it to see if the blood returns in my heart quickly. That's what the EVAP system is doing. Close, seal the system, pulling it down, sealing it, trapping it, and then venting it. That's as simple as I can explain it to you. And this graph shows it. So we're using up here, we're using vehicle speed. I put it up there, but it's, again, it's not load dependent. There's the, per, uh, the vent solenoid. And until that vent solenoid rises to on, the monitor ain't happening as far as the leak test. Purge is shut down here, and chances are what was going on right through here in this car is the purge flow and seal is being tested right here. You asked about purge flow and seal. It might be on the back end of the test, and it could be the cause of your small leak but this is where they're gonna try and determine if it seems to be functioning properly. So we're gonna basically, in some cases, they're gonna let it flow, look at fuel trim, see if there's a change, close it down, and if the purge is closed, and the back, the pressure sensor's over here, the engine's here, the purge is here, the pressure sensor's here, and that thing is sealed, should this thing change? It didn't change. If it's leaking, what's gonna be pulling on the system? It's gonna be pulling a vacuum. If it passes that test, we're good. Okay, so here we are, we pull the system down. We've got our FTP, which this happens to be, let's see, this one is off of, uh, look at the number real quick. We're at two five, we're going down to one six, here we go. So here we are at normal atmospheric pressure, 250, 2.5. We go ahead and pull the purge, we do what we call the large leak test. We purge, we pull it, we pull it, and look at what's going right here. Pulling down, pulling down. Right in here, this is pulling the system down to achieve as low a level of vacuum as we can. Now, we're gonna close the purge with the vent closed and we're gonna trap it. And we're gonna look for this to decay and how rapidly it decays. If it decays too rapidly based on the speed of it, we got a small or very small leak. If it doesn't decay, we pass the test. Then we're going to open the vent way over here, and we vent it, look at what happens to the pressure of the vacuum in the system. It goes up. If there was a hose that was restricted, or a vent solenoid, PO466, 
the vent is restricted, this would be going up, either not going up or it'd be going up slowly in that set of code. So that's what we call recovery through here. That is everything but the key off system. We pulled it down, we trapped it, we looked for deterioration, decay, then we let it go. We're done. Okay, now this one's a little different. I want you to look at this one and tell me what's different about this one. Do you have any comments on this one? What's gradual? <coughs> Okay, vent's closed. So let's look in the vent section. Wherever that vent is closed, let's look in that section. It's like one of my cursors is off. I changed the size of the picture. I threw the cursors off. But look where the vent's closed up on top. Follow it down. Did we open on? Did we open the purge on this car? Is the purge open in the second line? Yeah. And I was going to do something. Look over here. Now my also be in the back. Since we got the bigger room, let's take advantage of it. Let me, let me get this going up here. You, oops, darn it. Let me zoom in. And let's take a look at that. A little better? Yeah. Okay, that's the purge command right there. Is the purge being commanded? Yes. Is it responding? No. Slowly. Is, there, is it pulling down? No. It, it's coming down slowly. Oh, yeah. It's coming down. Look at that. Fuel tank pressure, pressure in bolts. It's What's coming, happening right here? It's, it's coming down slowly. It's coming down slowly. Opposite. Okay, if you take a look, the purge itself. Okay, there we go. Look at the top. Does the purge ever close? No. Does the purge ever close? No. It's no. just food cycling. No. This is an EONV. This is an engine off natural vacuum leak car, which a lot of them are. We don't do the small leak test of the car running. All we want to do is make sure that we achieve the lowest level of vacuum we require to achieve. Oh, okay. In this case, we did. So the, gro the gross leak or large leak test is done. We're not doing a small leak now because when are we doing it? When the engine's off. You see where, I'm, you see where we're going there? Yes? No? Marcus? Oh, it's running. It's running. You pull the vacuum down, this happened to be a GM, so the voltage goes up, so to everybody else. So the voltage going up, pressure's dropping, purge is open, but in here there's nowhere where we're closing it to trap it. All this test cared was, did we pull enough vacuum? And I want this word emphasized from here on out. It's like flags and monitors. I think we got you all starting to change, but you're still going to say monitors like I do. Largely, get rid of that term. Do not teach that term. Teach what GM teaches, weak vacuum. Weak vacuum means the FTP didn't get to where it was supposed to be. That does not mean there's a leak. What if the purge doesn't fully open? You're not gonna pull it. What if it doesn't open? You're not gonna pull it. But I guarantee you, as soon as someone says there's a large leak code, what machine are they pulling out? Smoke. They're gonna waste 20 or 30 minutes on their smoke machine. Weak vacuum means we didn't achieve the level we were expected here. It does not mean there's a leak. Or somebody's gonna turn the gas cap, right? Nobody's ever done that. <laughs> there is recovery. A little bit of recovery to see if once the purge is reduced, do we turn to atmospheric pressure when the vent is open? So let me pull that up. See where the vent opened? We do have a recovery time in here. Let me pull it up. There's a recovery time right there. Looking for restrictions. So on my list, I said with the OMB, we do weak vacuum, we do restriction. Then we're going to do the small leak with the engine off. Are we clear on that? So everybody see the difference between the two slides? Jonathan? Yeah. What are all codes that? That'd be your, well, depending on the year car, that'd be your 440 or your 455. Or 446, right? No, uh, 446 typically will pop up in the recovery section. Because what it's expecting is it wants to see the system go back to atmosphere. So you're dumping it out through the back door. And because you didn't reach it, it's saying there's a restriction. 4046 just means there's a restriction. 
But a lot of them will say, oh, the vet didn't open it. Yeah, the, uh, but with it, with it, uh, the 442, I think you said? 442 would be your small leak on an old car, or 456 on a new car, very small leak. And you said this one was set, which one? This one right here, this was an EOMB car, so this would set uh, either a four, uh, four, four, five, six for a 456 for small leak, or 455 for a uh, weak vacuum or large leak test. This was a perfectly operating system. What I wanted to do is get you the trigger on this, this difference between the two diagrams. See, we're doing these tests here. We're closing the purge right in here. This purge is closed at that point right there. See the small leak test right there? It's closed, but it's not here because it doesn't care about the small leak until the engine shut off. You all know how that works. Take a gallon of gas, put it out in the sun, sealed up. What's going to happen at 100 degrees in the afternoon? What's going to happen tomorrow morning? That's EOMB. Can't say anything simpler than that. So, but we're not going to do it with the car running. That was the difference. And we've been using EOMB since 2003 on cars. Jim's been using them since then. Ford did some. Honda introduced them a little later. Nissan's using them. Engine off, natural vacuum. Chrysler's using them. Okay? So, I want to make sure we see the difference between I call this vacuum decay because it's checking for the very small leak. I call this just EOMV because we're only doing the weak vacuum, but no small leak here. We're going to finish up. We're going to show you the engine off testing here. And you can capture these on some on cars if you're really clever. Now I'm going to get specific here for a minute because it's relating to uh, something I want to show you. This happens to be a Nissan Infiniti drive cycle. Uh, if I was going to use this, I would tell you 2003 and older because they have what we call a middle solenoid. Uh, we did our cruise test, everything, oops, everything happened here, CAT, O2, but EVAP did not run so you came down here. And I'm going to show this to you in actual video on this car. We had to go from 0 to 35 miles an hour hours quickly. Why? What are we doing to the tank at this time? What are we building up in the tank? Pressure. Guess what Nissan tests this system? <clears throat> Under pressure. So, again, I'll show this to you. It has no pressure sensor. Oh, it has a pressure sensor. Oh, yeah. Oh. But it has a temperature sensor in the tank that it wants to see rise because when pressure rises, what happens to temperature? It rises with it. So let's see. No, no pump. This, if you've ever been to my website, and that's on the end last slide, and some of you got it yesterday. When I did do patterns, I always told you at each pattern what you were trying to accomplish with the previous diagram. It says right here, depending on fuel tank level increase, the EVAP monitor might run at this time after some decels. I'll show this to you on the live car, it'll be easier. Nissan were the most insane. We're like 140. 140. Different drive cycles. Different. Oh yeah, no, that, that, that was, was, no, was, that was 96, 97. Let's not even talk about those. <laughs> those are, some of those were nightmares. First of all, you're gonna do EVAP, before you start that car up, you qualify the PIDs. And these are the PIDs I always look at. Earlier I told you, what to, for this system, most systems will work, what about, is this ready to run EVAP? No. Why? Too high. Temps. Too high. Temps too high. Temps too high. Ah, but never say always and never say never. This is a Nissan. We don't care. How many have Nissans in the shop for teaching? Anybody? Great one to teach it on because you can run the EVAP monitor all day long as long as you get the tank too high. Okay. Also, from cap monitor, we have temp, but I, I don't normally pull that up for this, but if I wanted to fill this up, so I did it. Fuel level, 94%. Ah, could that be a blocker? Yes. Yeah, because it's almost a full tank. There's no expansion area for vapor. So that's a blocker right there. Don't even spin your, spin your wheels. Could you run the other monitors? Absolutely, yes. But that's a blocker for evap right there. The first two aren't. Okay. Now, if I said to you this is a Toyota with a pump system, you say, I don't care. Toyota said I can run this in a full tank with a pump. But we're not talking about that right now. Purge is off. Don't forget voltage. Voltage is absolutely critical on EVAP, especially key off systems. Because these things can take up to 45 minutes with the vent solenoid on. The vent solenoid on, that means the PCM's alive. It's a parasitic drain. So you've got to have good EVAP. Uh, system voltage to run it. And then the EVAP system pressure. This is a can car. 
I hate this. I, I shouldn't say it's. I dislike using the word Pascal. I'd rather see kilopascal in there. Finer measurement, but it's there. Okay. Here's what I was telling you, Mike. I didn't adjust volume on this. If I get a little loud here, Charlotte, besides me, your Nissans have this in the tank. This is why I'm setting this out right now, because you can run these all day long. It has a temp sensor in the tank. It needs to rise four degrees Fahrenheit from the time you took key on engine off. So I always tell people, if you're testing a Nissan, go over to the OEM side of the scanner and get the fuel temperature before you start. Because if you know that when you're driving the car, if it's a cool day and you haven't risen four degrees Fahrenheit or 2.2 degrees Celsius minimum, you're not running that test. That's why we slosh the tank. That's why you're up and down on that drive cycle, trying to get the fuel to slosh, build up some pressure in there so you can run it. Okay? And on your scan tools, there is, on the OEM side, there is a bi-directional test to basically run it through its temperature range to see if it's working properly. But they've been using this since 1998. Okay? It's a pin that's really important. And I want to point out some of the cars. There's more to this than the full class, but I want to pick out some things that I want you to be aware of. Okay, so here's one. This one over here is a passing test. I want you to kind of focus on the bottom down here. This has the vent. This has the, the middle, the bypass solenoid. And basically, if you're ever working on a Nissan, it's very simple. When you're purging from the tank, from the system, you don't need full vacuum to the tank. You want a restriction in there. What Nissan did is they put a solenoid. And when they want to pull from the tank, then they turn it on. And there's your purge flow. Fuel level, system voltage, this is early. I'm going to give you numbers and everything in a little bit. There's the fuel temperature sensor. So let's go ahead and run this. I think a little bit. When the purge, when the vent closed, the purge closed. So we're not drawing on the tank anymore. We're sealed. Keep watching. This was 3.36 earlier. We went to 3.7. We go back a second. So we pick up on that. That's this. That you wouldn't have picked up on yet. See the 3.30 right here? Watch what happens here. Okay, so that was the The back door's closed, the front door's closed. What am I building up in my arm? What's my arm start to do if I leave the tourniquet on here besides going down? It starts to drop. 
Well, this is that system right now. We're testing in a positive pressure, not a vacuum. System is sealed, pressure is going up. Look at the temperature sensor. Did it go up? That's what you do. Did it run the test? Because what does it know is building up in the system? Controlled pressure. This is one of the few times you'll ever see the back door closed and the front door closed where they're testing under pressure. And that's what Nissan does. So they did through 2003, 2004, depending on the model you had. Um, not pulling this down, they're just playing pressurizing. And then shortly, watch what happens on the top of the screen here. When they open up, watch the system. Watch, watch this system Then open, pressure went back down, voltage, no restrictions. Okay. So this is a system testing under pressure. So then what Nissan did on 2004 and newer, and the way you know it is, what's missing between the two bottom charts? Oh, did I miss something here? I'm missing something here. What happened here? Let me see something. <clears throat> this one had the middle solenoid. What would happen there a second? This one doesn't have one. Okay, so let's run this one. You watch this one. This one okay, focus on this one right here. Notice it has a different voltage. It's a newer system. With no split system. It's all one. Watch the vent control so on. Just focus on that one right now. See if that works. That probably stopped the video. Nah, that's what I was thinking. Now nah, I can't do it. Stop the video. Okay, watch this one. Watch this. Watch these two right here. So get the system ready to test. Purge is 91% open right now. Green cycle. Keep watching. Focus on the vent. Nothing happens without the vent solenoid. Okay, what just happened? The vent turned on, but what's open? The purge is open now, so we start to pull this down against the closed back door. Now we're doing our vacuum decay and our weak vacuum test, as I call it. You saw what I call it a gross leak check. There's the key. Okay, keep watching. Drop, this is dropping a little bit, right here. First volume. Okay. This, this one will take a little while. There's an issue on this one. We're down to 3.88 volts. First is now closed. Now they're sealing the system. Failing. So this is going to happen about three times. This can go to zero, come back up. Now we're venting again. Now watch again. What happened? Venting on three different times. It's testing. It's running multiple tests per trip because it's failing. Just watching you a little bit more. Got a little ways to go on this. Still open. Still pulling a little bit. Now it's off again. Now watch. I was pointing the wrong arrow there. Wrong thing. Keep watching.
quality test. Okay. So what was the point of that one? To prove what I've said to you. If it's failing, you can run multiple tests in one trip. You can only flip the flag once per trip. So this one was failing. So you saw this vent over here being turned on and off three different times, trying to say, hey, I really want to believe this system's good. But after three tries, it's not good. So it set a pending code the first trip. If you've got a camera in your shop, guys, use it. You cannot do this live. Impossible. You record it, and you go back to it in some kind of program and make yourself a teaching video. Watching this, I call it the Monday morning football coach. You had a game yesterday, you're going to review all the video tomorrow. If it failed the test three times, then why is it only running a pending code? Because it failed it in the same trip. Remember now, now we got to turn the key off, wait 10 seconds, ballpark, run it again. If it fails on the next trip, now you got a DTC. Okay? But you already see there's an issue, yeah. One nice thing on Nissan too, uh, it's not in all the aftermarket scans, but they do have a confirmation DTC check on this, where you can actually run a service plate check on this of your own. I <coughs> like to run the check, but this is just to show you. This is the earlier system, which I'm going to explain a little bit. This is the newer system, and the voltage was higher. This voltage was a little lower because of two systems. But I wanted you to see that when I've said to you that you've been with me for two days, and I said to you this morning, this afternoon, some of you the first time, flip the flag once per trip, but it might run a test multiple times. It's a failing cap. It's a failing EGR. It may run that test multiple times in the same P cycle, but when it gets done, it's only going to flip that flag once per trip. Never more than that. But testing could be more than once. So when you hear the word non-continuous, only test once per trip, no, it only flips the flag once per trip. I test multiple times. Okay. Okay, so I thought what we do here is get a little system specific now. These happen to be the early Toyotas. Still a lot of these out there. Those little Camrys and all those cars and Corollas. Hey, let's face it, no one Corolla is still one of the most bulletproof ones out there for many years. Through 2000, they used what they called the non-intrusive system. It was called the early type. Look at the second bullet. It says it can only test canister side vacuum or pressure, fuel tank pressure. So here's what I'm going to show you. And I have a diagram to show you. I'm the pressure sensor. You guys are the full tank, fuel tank. You guys the canister. Which side do I default to, does it say? What's it say up there for default? So here I am. I'm reading you guys. I don't give a squat about you guys. I'm ungrounded. I'm looking at you guys. When the PCM grounds me, here's what I do. Now, I don't care about you guys. I care about you guys. You're connected to the engine, so you're going to be in the what? Pressure or vacuum? Vacuum. You're not contacting the engine. You're going to be sealed. So what are you going to build? That's the system in a nutshell. It never tests two as one. It's either you as a vacuum or you as a pressure. These were the early systems. In the actual course, I have videos of that. We don't have time for all that today. And I'll show you what I mean by mechanically sealed on another one. And it does have a readiness flag with test, but it won't determine the size of the leak. We're going to see this in the case study. So here's what I just drew for you. The blue was me looking at that. The blue is me looking at you guys. You're sitting there doing nothing right now. Okay? When I'm grounded, that solenoid is grounded. Here's what happens. Now the pressure sensor flips over to you guys. See the difference? Never one, always two halves. You're a vacuum, you're a pressure. The two don't meet. That's just how they. It just how they That's the way they designed it. And believe me, you live by codes on this one, you'll die by codes on this one. If anyone ever works with it on these vehicles, you'll see 440, 441, and 446 on almost everything. Yep, could be one of those. You've got to understand the system once you do. And I'm going to go into this a little more later on. Now, then they decided to change it to a little different system. Tank, I mean, canister, tank, pressure sensor. Where do I default this time? So guess what? When I turn the key on, I'm reading you guys. When I'm grounded, here's the difference. I'm looking at both of them. See the difference? Key on, I'm reading tank. And this is a really cool test if you want to test Toyota's beliefs. 
that car has been sitting and that system is sealed and it is and I'm gonna show you why and I read this system over here what am I going to be under if it's been sitting a while it's cooled down <laughs> if I'm in a vacuum and it's been sitting for a few hours what do I know about this system in the back half it does not have a what I learned that as soon as I turned the key on because the car sat and cooled and it has a leak now you should be asking why because the vent is normally what Open. Open. Hmm. I wonder how Toyota does that. So let's take a look. Well, let's take a look at that system first. So here we are. There's you guys. Three of you right there. There's you over here. And then when I'm grounded, the system becomes one. I see you both. Okay? And there we are. Now I'm looking at the whole thing. Remember the other one? It was one or the other? Never both? Vacuum pressure. This is both. Okay? Oh, I'm going to come back to those other parts later on. I'll explain that. How about LDP? How many dealt with that leak detection pumps? Still using them. I call it the bicycle pump. Anybody here do a lot of bike riding or did? Get a flat tire? What's the first thing you try and do? Pump it back up. And then you ride it for a while to make sure it doesn't leak. If you go down the road and it doesn't change again, you know something happened, but it don't have a big leak. You pump it up, you drive 20 feet, ride 20 feet, and it goes flat again, you got a what? You go to sleep. Well, that's how an LDP pump works. It has three phases. One, build up pressure in the system. Pump the bike. You know, when you got a new tire too, it's real easy to pump. Then what happens after a little while? You want to prove this, take a car tire and make it flat. They have to give a student a bicycle pump. <laughs> and let them pump till they're blue in the face. Don't give them too big a tire. Or give them a tube or something. Yeah, that's me. And then once they get to a certain point, if there's no leaks, what happens when they try and push in? Someone's going to throw them across the room, right? You like that, huh? Yeah. So build it up. Check it for leaks. I'm going to show you this in a video. And then let it bleed off. That's what an LDP pump does. So get out that tire and let them pump that thing a little bit. Maybe you can give them a little something, a little more. Or maybe pressure. a wheelbarrow. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Wheelbarrow. Oh, you're too easy. Yeah, too easy. We're gonna get. There we go. This is a perfectly running system. I used the DRB3 back then because it had everything I needed in it to show for teaching. It's gonna pop up a scope in a little bit. Watch what happens here. Oh, you know what? Oh, yeah, yeah it's fine. Okay, get ready. Yeah, that's a uh, lot. I'm just checking time, make sure we're good. We're going to be fine. Yes, let's run it. Come on, LDP, pop up. Yeah, it's going. This is now, watch up here on the left. Watch the first test thing. Doing an idle up initialization. LDP to report the condition of the pump. This is the solenoid pumping the system up, rapid pumping, getting the tire up to be able to test it. Because you don't test the tire for leaks when it's half full, do you? You fill it up as much as you can and you dump it in water and you fill it up, right? We got to get it to that point. So this is testing it right here. Okay, what it did first was check the switch because it's the reporting component for the system. If the switch is bad, there's no point testing the system. Okay? Forget all the leak checks. So let's go. Now, this will vary on another fuel from the system. 
and the tank's sitting uh, low. So this pumped it up. This is testing it. It releases it, it releases it for a certain time. It checks the switch again. I watch. It'll pump it up again. At this point, the system's equal to pressure. There's no diaphragm movement above or below. Pressure's equal on both sides of the diaphragm. It doesn't have to switch this and change it. That's good. That means the pressure's equal on both sides. It's not going to move. Three Here we go. Now we're going to speed that up just a little bit until I see some activity in there. For the sake of time. There we go. Now. If I have the EVAP system sealed and it's locked because there's pressure on both sides, what's the only way in the system for me to dump that pressure? What do I got to open? It has no vent valve because it's a, it's a, oh, my purge, and if the, if the switch changes, what does that mean about the diaphragm? You drop to the bottom, saw the purge change, and says the system works. So watch this one right here, coming up. That's the switch, yeah, changing yeah. state. So that tells you that we just opened the purge and pumped it, and the diaphragm is now moving to move again. And that's an LDP pump. Okay? Now let's look at a bad one. Okay, we just started dialing up. Yeah, thanks. Good. Gas cap is off. just switched on. Okay, I left the gas cap off of this one over here. Okay, remember, we got to build up the pressure first. We got that tire that's flat. Okay, so here we are again. Check the switch status by pumping up the diaphragm. Keep watching. Shuts it up a little bit and watch this turn up. Watch the little wire, watch the top of the little wire beat cycle. Every time the switch changes, that means the diaphragm is moving. Okay, that's the switch right there. What's happening to the recording pump and pump more frequently now? So it's that tire you filled up and rode 20 feet or 50 yards, and all of a sudden now you got to pump it back up again. And you got to keep pumping it because it's not holding pressure. We're not done yet. We're still in the test phase. Now watch, keep watching. You're going to see multiples up here shortly. Okay, we're done. There you go. Each one of those ones on the bottom is an attempt to pump that thing back up so it's equal. There's a pressure differential, that switch is moving down, closing. In this case, open, excuse me. It's going to keep trying, look at this. Not going to give up yet. See that? Three legs again. Trying again to pump it back up. What it's coming down to is Mark's riding his bike and he's want to stop and put a new tire or patch on it. And he's going to stop every 20 yards and pump up the tire. He knows it's got to be. Yeah, we'll just be that if we get into it. It'll go about three times. Now this one, look at what happened even more. This one got even worse. This is a gross thing. <coughs> look at that. Because the cap's off right now. The tire's got a big hole in it. on There it ends. Now let's see what we get for a code. And you got yourself a PO455 grossly. 
It's the only way I can find to teach LDP, everybody. You, the videos just kill it. You try and teach this without something like this, it's tough. This is a scope tied to the switch. The switch is the reporting component, which we're going to get into. Okay, EOMV, engine off natural vacuum leak detection. Now we're going to finish that one I showed you earlier. Been around for a while, test a very small leak. Typically on these systems, without the pumps, they still are normal vacuum. I use the word vacuum decay, but vacuum system to pull it to see if we can get, we don't have a, a weak vacuum or gross leak. This is some of the conditions. I'm not going to read them all to you. I'm not going to read them. Remember this one we did earlier? Okay, remember the purge didn't close up there? So it's only pulling down and says, yep, I was able to achieve that level of vacuum. We're good. There's no weak, it's not weak vacuum or gross leak. This is another one, same way. I just did on a different, different view. We don't close the purge. That's the key. So here's what EONV means. It's that gas tank sitting in the sun, three quarters full, it's expanding. If we drive the car long enough and we turn the car off, and this thing, PCM, and remember the PCM is coming to life. If you want to do this, get your scan tool hooked up and have your EVAP data on the scanner before you turn this car off. Because when the PCM wakes up, the scan tool will wake up and your PIDs will be there and you can capture it. If we shut the car down and let it sit for a period of time, it could be anywhere, the typical, I've seen GMs flip real quick. I've seen Nissan take 15 minutes. I've seen Honda take 20 minutes. So there's a time to let it stabilize. When the PCM wakes up, and here's a, this is the minimum on all cars, one inch of water column. My numbers are showing no more than about 1.5 inches of water column, because if you get too high, what is it? It's too volatile. Did I put? Oh, it's supposed to be H2O. Excuse me. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Mark. I'll change that. I'll, I'll fix that. That's why I'm doing all this. I mean, I just put these in today because I wanted to give you some numbers. It should be H2O like it was on the other one. Okay, let's just go with one, one inch of water column to 1.5 inches of water column. I got my also put my uh, bitches out of place. If we're in this window, we're done. The system's good. Goodbye. Test is done. We test it under pressure. If we're too high, or too low, the PCM won't run the test. It'll wait and try and repeat it again. After a couple of attempts, it'll say, hey, no good. We're not going to test this way. We're done under pressure. So let me show you it on a car. This is a big car. After shutdown, one inch of water column, 1.23 in this case. Vent is, uh, the vent is on. Purge is closed. The engine's off. Look at the pressure buildup. Pressure build up. We're in that window I showed you. If we're in that window, we're done. Pressure phase is done. EVAP is good. If we're too low, because we're not volatile enough, or we're too high, the test is suspended. The PCM may try another time or two to test it under pressure, but once it doesn't like that, it's going to say, hey, we're going to go to the next phase and we're going to let the car sit. Now we're going to go to the phase two the negative or vacuum phase part. If we let the car sit long enough, I do the same thing here. We're going to let it sit a while, let it sit a while, let it sit a while. Eventually, it's going to cool into a, remember the gas can? Done. This big, we're not testing it. We check it again, still too volatile. Let it sit, let it cool tomorrow morning. It may not take all that time. If we're greater than one inch of water column, testing is done. That's your vacuum decay. What makes up the PCM or is the timer just I saw a timer. That's why I say to you, if you want to see this, you want to capture this, put EVAP data on the OEM site typically, on your scan tool, while you're driving the vehicle, shut it off, let it sit there, don't do anything else, don't turn the key back on anything, and to see if it comes alive. If that scan tool comes alive, this test is running. You capture it. John? One inch of water column. That's, that's extremely low. Isn't mm -hmm. it? That's all you want in EVAP system. We're talking that's, that's, less than a, uh, that's less than a quarter. Oh, yeah. Well, remember my chart earlier? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, we're going to see that again. So, the best thing I tell you is get either a manometer 
the steer went out and go and watch the gauge go like that, and then get an inches of mercury gauge and go. You're lucky, you know. You're lucky to get him. So you got to show that to the student. He's very low. He just wants a little bit of cooling in the vacuum. That's all it's looking at. That's why you never apply shop air to the system, and you never have a purge 100% open without being doing a second. What are you going to do that tank? You don't want to collapse it. So other than fixing that, I'll fix that before I put this out. Does everybody get the idea? So what does that look like on the other side of the spectrum? See this right here? It wasn't volatile enough. But look at what happened over time. Boom. One inch of water column. So phase one didn't run, didn't pass, because it was too volatile. Phase two ran and passed under vacuum. That's what the EOMB does. Engine off, natural vacuum leak detection. Expansion, contraction. One or the other. Are you okay with that? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. I just added this to the class from what it was before. Just a reminder, if you're running service pay tests, uh, service pay tests typically will not flip the flag. It will run tests, determine pass or fails from different monitor tests, but it will not flip the flag. And it will not run in most cars the .020 test because the engine is off, it doesn't have enough vapor to test that way in your service aid test. You go into Ford, you go into Honda one time, they used to tell you it doesn't run it. Best example I can give you, uh, let's say Robert over here is my Honda tech, and he's my um, Acura tech. This is my classroom for real, I'm doing this stuff. And the Acura tech says, hey, why is it when we do the, we do the service pay test and the small leak test, uh, the cars come back. And the Honda guy says, no, we don't do that. We drive it. It's simple, because they don't run the .020 test to the scanner. You've got to drive the car to build up enough vapor pressure in there to do testing. Okay? So you got to think about that when you're doing this. Okay? Go ahead. How many times will it run the test and fail it? Oh, this is only, this is going to be you. Now remember, you're running the test. You're commanding it. This will only do it once. Okay. Now, there is a service pay test in a video I have where GM shows you in their service pay test, they're literally running this. It's a failed car, it's got a small leak, they ran it three times. Okay, and then will it be incomplete? Then yeah. Okay. And oh, let me, the good statement. He asked me if it would be incomplete when it's done. First of all, it won't affect the readiness flags at all. But always remember this, pre-can, but let's go to can first. Whenever you see complete on a can car, what complete should mean to you is, it didn't mean it passed or failed, but it was <coughs> done testing. Right. So earlier when he asked me about the two trips, a system can pass in one trip and flip, it can pass in two trips, but it can fail in two trips too. So on the second trip, what complete means on a can car is done testing. Now go look at your mill and your DTCs and see what's there, or if there's nothing there, in theory you pass. Okay, what, what, what happened two trips and still incomplete? <laughs> then it's not done testing yet. It's still in the process of finishes testing. Okay. Now, if it's a pre-can car, they don't have to flip the complete. So they may have done both their tests, like you just said, and should, and have a light on, and, but it still says incomplete, because on pre-can, they didn't have to flip it if it That's failed. Okay. They only flipped it if it passed. They actually took this from the early Hondas. Honda was the first one that switched to complete, and they were done testing. And then you had to decide through your DTC and your mill if it passed or failed. Okay? Then they put that to everybody. That, I hope that answered your question. It doesn't have to do with the test failing, but not uh, uh, outside of the window in which you need to pass uh, in order for it to be completed. It, it, it's just that it's, uh, I'm trying to understand, but in other words, if it, faith, it, it, if it did all the tests and it, and it, and it failed uh, not enough, will that cause it to be incomplete? As well? Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the service paid test will not affect the flag status at all. Okay. You can't do any of the flag status through the service paid test. It can also have a permanent code sitting there. It doesn't erase that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you have permanent codes, it'll never erase that. Right. But it won't set it either at that time. It'll just verify that what you need for system operation is functional or not. Good question. Okay. Let's get into what brought the customer into the shop. And let's get into EVAP, a little more diagnostics. First of all, I always tell students, they didn't come in because they like you and they want to spend money with you. Oh, no. 
a lot of times evaps don't come in and there's an issue because guess what? What didn't happen to the car in most cases? There was no change of performance. But put the mills on, so they're coming in. DTC is present. And I like to use this word, sequence of events. I teach ignition system and fuel system. I'm going to teach a sequence of events. So I'm going to say to you, in the ignition system, where do you test first? I heard battery. Spark. Spark. You check for spark. I use a simple day. I test the simplest place to access first. Start the car. And if it's in the middle of the system and it works, what do I know about the front half of the system? Good. It's good. I'm going that way. Okay? So I was I like this sequence. I like to picture the system. Okay? If this failed, now if the EONV failed with the engine off. What do I know about this, the large sweep though? It probably what? Probably passed. I'm doing the back half of the system. Because right, it already ran the large. It already ran. It won't run the small unless it runs yeah, the It's going to have to pass that before it run that. Exactly. So what does that mean? First of all, as I was said yesterday, I was saying again today, one or more multiple monitor tests completed testing. Doesn't mean the flag flip. It just means it's done some testing. What to do next in an evap, I believe this strongly. Do not touch anything. You're going to spend two hours trying to find a problem after you turn the cap, thinking that might be the problem. And it might have been, but you still got to test it to verify it, right? Don't touch anything. Okay, in this case, I'm pulling out the case study we're going to use in the end, but I got a code here. I got a 446. I got a freeze frame. Does anybody see the actual problem in this freeze frame? Oh, can you guys see that? Okay, let me pull that up a little bit. My nose is a little more of a glare here. If this helps at all, I don't know. No, you can't get both at the same time. Does anybody see it? anything in the free frame? Problem? The answer is? But it's a vent code problem. That's what it said. Anything in there? Free frame doesn't tell me squat, does it? Nothing. Just tells me how the car is being driven. Uh, it was being driven at 10 miles an hour at a 33% load in closed loop at that temperature. That's all it tells me. So the next place I go look in this car is I go to mode 6 and guess what I got? Now I don't know what that means yet, but did I find my area to focus on? That quick. I'm not going to go in and look at this one up until we get to the end, but I just want to show you where you can go if you're using mode six. And this was a free can car, yet it still led me where I want it to be. I know on a Toyota, zero two is always eval on the pre can cars. I have to go look this up possibly. Simple, not a problem. Okay, how about this one here? You see this one a lot? EVAP not complete though. So what's the easy excuse to say? Oh, the EVAP monitor didn't what? Didn't run, didn't complete. So let's go look at mode six again. No codes, first of all. There's mode six. There's no numbers in there. Oh, hold on. Go to, go to the top first. Ah, no, there's, there's a reason why they're both up there. Good question. Notice the top one, 0 0.090. That is the so-called gross sleep test. Is it populated? Yeah. Did it pass? Yeah. Okay. What this is, and we you were with me yesterday, we always say, if you find, I got you looking for the zeros. You did. You got Any of you were here yesterday looking for the zeros? I said I would tell you today. That is, see what, it, look at the name of the test. Look at the name of the test. Follow up. What happened to the top test? Pass or fail? Yeah, so guess what? There's no need for the follow up test. So that zero is okay. I tricked you. I was taught, I taught for you. Hey, I taught students something simple with equipment. I'm going to teach you with it and then I'm going to burn you with it. Okay? Just when you get comfortable with a piece of equipment, I'm going to burn you because you're going to miss something. Does that make sense? It wasn't needed. Now, if this test had failed, it might have done this as a verification to see why. Test it like, if I test under pressure and I pass, I don't need to test under vacuum, right? If I don't test under pressure, then I'll go test under vacuum. When it's showing the follow-up, it's following up for the exact same test. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But well, why does it say not complete? So it didn't run the test. It didn't need to because what did it already do? So that's uh, Okay. Now, 
Did the EVAP, part of the EVAP monitor test run, yes or no? Yeah. Now let's find out why it didn't run. What do we got for the very small lead test? It didn't run. There's my blocker. I call it my blocker. That quick, I know it ran the growth, the large lead test, but it hasn't run the what? Maybe the car got turned back on too soon. It didn't sit long enough to test the key off system. Look at it. It already did the purge flow. So my blocker on this car is the what? The 0.020 test with the engine off. Yeah, and this this car was purposely turned back on after a couple minutes. Had I waited maybe 15, 20 minutes on this, I might have had a good result. But I didn't want to. I wanted it for this purpose because I knew I've always yeah. Go ahead. On your values right there, you got a, is that a nine zero point? Is that a nine ninety point zero on a, on the yes. value and a minimum of ninety point zero? Yeah, but that's it. That's in uh, decimal format. So it's not it's not converted to any unit value. Okay. It's not that, that's the problem with the older ones, and you have to be careful using mode six on old ones because they're in decimal and they're not assigned a pressure reading of any kind. So the bottom line here is on the purge flow, it's just letting us know that it met the minimum. You got to be careful with this. I was teaching the mode six. Just because it's close to the minimum, please don't go chase the problem. Sometimes what they'll do is they will only report. If it makes it the minimum, that's what they'll report. Okay. So be careful. I've seen that on Honda, early Hondas with catalytic converters. You would think they were dead and they were fine. But if it failed, if it really did fail this test, it might do a follow-up test of this one too. So let me show this to you on a Ford. Any other questions on Let me show this to you on the next one to show it's plenty clearer. This is off the IDS. I can't show it to you any better, but I was just trying to get. Look at the top one up there. Do you see any zeros in the top boxes? Phase four, purge, valve, stuck, open, limit. Zero, zero, zero. But what's the test above it? Phase zero is excessive vacuum limit. It passed. Because test one up there passed, there is absolutely no need to do what? A follow-up test in that second line. Now, I know the wording isn't that clear, and you're probably saying, well, how do you know that? You have to go to that Ford site I mentioned yesterday and look up that information if you're not clear. Because the vacuum limit was cheap, we know the valve's not stuck open. <clears throat> so the top line is good, the middle line, there was no need to do the test. It's what I call a ghost monitor. It's there, but it may not be need needed. Now, let's go to the next line. This is the natural vacuum leak portion of the test. It tests, what did this car test under? Pressure or vacuum? And pass. It tested on that first line, 3C, it tested under, uh, ah, yeah. You said vacuum, what's the first two words explaining it? You have a natural vacuum system. What is it testing under? Positive pressure, it passed. So there's no reason to do what? The vacuum test. So. In mode six, if you see zeros in a T-VAP, chances are it either had not run or it's a follow-up test. So you've got to know what you're looking at. And down here, T-VAP system line block, it has a result. Because of that, fault confirmation, we don't need to do it. Okay. Engineers don't want these things failing on one test. But they might repeat it like I showed you earlier. They might run alternate tests to verify it. So this is where you got to be careful when you're dealing with mode six. I don't care if it's can or non-can. The other thing you want to make sure you do is if you're not familiar with this stuff and you got a scanner, is get a good car first. Yeah. Look at what the normal data is. That's why I tell you, we're, we wouldn't have learned. I wouldn't be teaching you what I'm teaching you if we didn't have the fleet that we had. And I learned many, many years ago: you don't know good, you don't know bad. Any of you? Have, let me ask you: any of you teach can classes? <laughs> Dedicated? Scan tool? <coughs> what level do they have to be in there to use a scan tool? Breathing? Breathing? <laughs> no, but they have to pass. Oh, okay. Come well, on. What, no, what criteria do they have to have before they can use a scan tool? Usually rear electrical class, other ones. System operation and computer control, so you order normal map voltages or mass. There's my point. I get students ask me, do you teach scan tool class? I say, no. What? 
No, because if you don't know numbers, you don't know scantles. Simple as that. If you're teaching scantles, get out of the business. They've got to know how things work. But I want you to see this, because you're going to pop this up someday in a class, and you're going to wonder. Now you know. This is a ghost monitor. It's not needed. Okay? Visuals. Don't forget to do visuals on the system. You know, back to basics. Don't overlook things. So let's look at a few case studies of that. Rotten hoses. This was at March Place and down in the ocean. Oh, it could have been Skyline in the summer with all the ocean dew up there. No, this was given by my buddy, my buddy Dan Marinucci in, in Ohio, I mean, uh, Illinois, excuse me, Ohio. And this is what happens to cars back there. Yeah. Well, my point here being is, use this. Now, look at this one. Okay, I want you to start in the upper right-hand corner. This is a BMW. Came in with a leak code. What do you notice about the liquid vapor separator for one? In the circle up there. It's not fastened in, is it? So what does that tell you? Somebody's already done. Somebody's touched it. What do you notice over here because that thing was hanging? Okay? Something not fastened? Now here's the cream of them all to tell you that you got to get to tell this person go get it fixed somewhere else. Look at what's stuck between the chassis and the body. <laughs> Number 18. Number 18. I didn't get a wrench that badly. I told the student he could take it home and fix it. My point being, that wasn't anything to do with the problem. But look at it, because of so many sloppy work. They rubbed the hose there. I've got some electrical ones here, but I just threw these in. How about this one? There's your uh, comment earlier about the perch solenoid. Canisters do break up. And someone can, the granulated charcoal can be very small to cause the problem you have and it can cause blockages, I'll show you. Okay? Don't be afraid to take those canisters and shake them. It seems like uh, we had a shop and we used to get a lot of those transit vans and those purge valves would set codes for vacuum in the tank and stuff like that. One more time? It set like a P1450 codes in the tank for excessive vacuum in the tank. Yep. Because they're leaking when they're not, there's not supposed to be flow there. And we can never find any of the charcoal like this they always like tap them hit them if it doesn't break up yeah if it doesn't break up I mean it's the way it should normally be but some of them if they're left loose or they weren't built properly and remember this you should, if you haven't cut open canisters you should because you'll be amazed what's not in there many of those canisters are only half filled because they were built for different engines and different uh, volume so when you open up there's a spring loaded thing that is holding that part of the canister up in place because there's only that much volume needed for that car but occasionally they come loose and they start to vibrate. Sometimes it may not happen. Yeah. They're easy to test, too. You just put a gauge on one side and back and pump on the other. It's a, it's a door, right? It should yep. be closed. You got it. And you, you've been out, somebody's been out for a wheeling? <laughs> it's a BLM truck there. <laughs> I did a lot of BLM trucks. Uh -huh. I, I should be politically correct. You find BLM. <laughs> Bureau of Land Management. Okay. I just want to be politically correct. I mean, and DEA trucks and, and all, you know, and the, yeah. and the suburbans. That's they it. were in the back there behind the spread fire right. in the perfect yeah. place. So, you know, EVAP, everybody thinks about leaks. Get off the leak kit. And we're going to get into that part very shortly. There's the cobweb. All right. Wow. Causing a hard to fill up car. Causing the vent code, causing your FTV voltage possibly to be out of whack. It's just a cobweb that found the heat up there and said, I'm going to go live up there for a while. And that happens. Okay. Some procedures. This is something I like. I call this, we're back to driver's seat diagnostics now. I want to know if my components are working properly. Forget the word monitor right now, any of that. Would, everybody, would that be a typical uh, criteria for, say, a purge to operate? If you went down a checklist and said, does a purge operate? Well, you better have no conflicting DTCs. ECT has got to be above a certain temperature. I'll use a ballpark number 140, 150. IAT can't be too cold. Closed loop, TP, part throttle, close throttle to part throttle, purge will be working. And be careful, some don't work in drive. I mean, park or neutral, you gotta go out and drive. So here you are, and you're wondering if you've got an EVAP problem. This is the card. Do I have an EVAP problem? At least flow problem. What can I learn from this capture? The top one is purge, bottom one is FTP. <coughs> yeah, <I'm just> <coughs> 
This is not with a leak test, guys. This is with the vent open. All I'm doing is sitting here because I want to know what can I learn in this picture about my reporting component? Is this stuck or does it seem to be operational on the bottom? Now I can start going, going further into the system because I know the reporting component isn't stuck. Always start there. Garbage in, garbage out. You over ignore that reporting component. And you better know good on these. I'll give you examples. When I open up my purge, what does this confirm is happening at my purge? It's pulling. It's pulling. And my FTP is changing. I'm ready to move on. And I call this non-readiness mode testing. Here's what I do. This is what we just looked at. This is truly when the monitor is running. But before I ever get there, I've got to know this. Because if you come in saying, oh, I can't get the EVAP monitor run, and you haven't verified that the purge and the FTP are working, don't worry about the monitor. This is done in the driver's seat. Never move the car. Got my scan tool in my hand. I rev it up. I capture this picture right here. Oops. Capture that picture. I know my FTP is working. It's already pulled down to 2.15 volts from 2.5, close to 2.5. It's flowing real quick. Now I can believe my reporting component and start going into the system to see what's operational. <coughs> uh, so I say here, ver always verify that the reporting component, your FTP, your fuel tank pressure sensor, or LDP read switch, NVLD switch, ESIM switch on your Chrysler's, make sure they're working because that's the reporting component about a leak. Understand normal system, uh, oh, system open uh, atmospheric pressure, voltage slash pressure. And does the FTP voltage change with vacuum from the engine as we saw previously? And you need to verify your switch operation. So here's what example. First of all, remember your FTPs are nothing more than pressure differential sensors. Atmosphere, tank. And the differential is the voltage. But never forget that little port on top they get stuck, they get plugged. Then that diaphragm gets stuck at a higher vacuum or pressure depending on the system. So typically use a higher vacuum and stuck. It won't return. It, it, anyone go back to the old C3 carburetor days of GMs in the 80s when they use a great pressure sensor? Yep. They call it a beam uh, a B map? Yeah. No, vacuum sensor, excuse me. The gray one. Vacuum sensor. That's what that was. The only difference in this case, one end's hooked up to the tank rather than the manifold. As you saw in the Chrysler, the first thing they're going to do is verify that switch operation in the LDP. If it fails this test right here, the Chrysler test I showed you, it's not running the rest of them. Stop right there. If this car fails this test right here, don't pull out the smoke machine. Even with a gross leak, this is going to move. I would say if you're under the hood, and I give New Sun's a good example, I can quickly disconnect the hose, stick the two hoses together, pull it down in the vacuum like nothing. I know it works. <laughs> Even with the cap off, it'll show a response? It'll pull yeah. it down. Oh, yeah. Because earlier he mentioned about testing the canister. The canister is a restriction in the system. Yeah. And if it's working, you will pull the vacuum against it. So nobody realizes that. No one talks about it. The canister is a restriction in the system. And you are pulling it against that, right? And then make sure the initial fuel tank pressure sensor is accurate. Oh yeah, yep. You got. That's where we're going to get into the voltage here shortly. Good point. Doesn't the engine usually speed up when uh, the purge comes on? It can, but be careful because uh, it all depends on how much vapor is in the canister. Okay. Because canisters do get depleted of vapor, and you're just sucking air. But yeah, there could be depending on how much is in there. There's an initial rush, but generally it's phased in. But yeah, it's possible. That's a confirmation that it flows. Good point. The yeah, Austin, when the purge flows, is it can sometimes serve. Initially, it might. Okay, so here's uh, Rick. This what you were getting at about knowing the the good values. I just threw a couple up there. We could go. There, it would have been nice if we had done something simple like 2.5 is atmospheric, anything below it is a vacuum, and anything above it is a pressure. Then GM came along, Toyota came along, Ford came along, and <laughs> Nissan came along, and the numbers began to change. That would be very typical. If you're working on Hyundai, Kia, Honda, 
2.5 cool sea level. GM decided to flip the wires in the pressure sensor, so up is vacuum and down is pressure. And 1.5 typically is your sea level voltage. So you got to know what you're working on. And it's what he's talking about. You got to know if you're working with the correct voltage to begin with. <laughs> Anyone ever turn GMs on and find you sitting up in the three and a half, four volt range? You're done. Stop your testing right there. But the code it will set is a PO466 because the vent's open. You can verify that real quick. Go back, take the gas cap, and do what? Take it off. If that voltage stays 3.9, 3.8, 4 volts, whatever it is, what do you know about the sensor? Because either it's drifting in the line or the sensor's no good. 90 percent, 99 percent of time it's going to be the sensor's no good. Time to replace it. Toyota, you will not see that on their scan. You might see 762 millimeters of mercury. You might see zero on a uh, gauge, meaning atmospheric. That's come voltage is captured right off the sensor. They do not report a voltage. Nissan had two generations. Remember the videos they showed you? The one over here had a middle solenoid, typically about 3.4 volts at sea level. This was a little below sea level. The system on the right only had one, the two solenoids, about 4.1 at sea level. Got to know these things. When you put that key on, you bingo, that's the right reading. Now I rev the engine up and I see it changing, I'm ready to go do my testing. Don't go beyond that. So I said, I give the students a car in the lab. It's an infinity. I got a block line to the pressure sensor. So a key on engine off, it reads great. And it has a PO4. 1441 for purge flow. It has a gross leak check and there's a smoke machine there. And I'm waiting to see what they're going to do. <laughs> Next thing I know, they got the damn smoke machine hooked up. And they haven't verified now. Could they hook up the smoke machine to verify the pressure sensor? Sure they could. But that's not the way you do it. <laughs> they did. And that's it. In all the labs we did in that class, the EVAP class, we probably trained 600 people. I'd say about 10% of them went to the smoke machine right away. They learn. You got to you got to do this first. I can put Ford up there, 2.6. These are numbers you got to have. And this is also the point of this one is make sure you have a switch in the system, NVLD, ESO. Make sure it works. Apply back into the system, whatever you need to do. Make sure it works. That's the reporting component. Garbage in, garbage out. Doesn't mean anything. If those those switches aren't working properly. There's my little chart again, just to remind you. I love uh, the smoke wizard that has a compound gauge built into the smoke machine. I can do my pressure, I can do my vacuum. Makes it really nice. Voltages, live by codes, die by codes. Typically, a good rule of thumb is, if I'm at 4.8 to 5 volts, I've got myself an open circuit. If I'm at zero to uh, zero point, uh, point two, uh, two volts, I it should be that should be point zero two. I'm gonna fix that. I got a shorter problem. Here's the problem: it's when it's in the middle. And this is what Rick was talking about. You got to know good because it does not do a rationality check on the EVAP pressure sensor. It doesn't say, oh, this thing should be two point five volts. This turn a key on and it's stuck at 3.5 volts, it's going to use that. And then it might set a code, the EVAP code, where it might use that pressure that will block the other monitors because it sees the pressure in the tank. So in the middle, there is no rationality. You have to do the rationality check by looking at that voltage with the key on engine off and then verify it changes. Okay, that's a big window. No rationality code uh, check on the pressure sensor. You okay with that? Does that make sense? Okay, I'm not advocating you go get your meter out and test your pressure sensors this way. I just want to make a point and show you if I test it directly at the pressure sensor and I get these readings, um, that's what I want. And this really should be 0.02. If I got 0.2, I definitely got a problem. Uh, well, actually, no, I, that'll work with codes. For codes, yeah, I wouldn't mind it that high, but for codes, that would work. Okay, bidirectional testing. Some have done it right, some haven't done it well. Um, most of your scanners have some kind of bi-directional testing, but remember, bi-directional 
happens in the PCM, not in the scan tool. The PCM doesn't have it, the car doesn't have it. And it won't happen on the global side. It's got to be on the OE side. We'll talk about the global side in a minute. If you're going to operate solenoids, check them multiple times, especially the vent. So here's why this is a purge solenoid test. Command is at zero, built into the scan tool. This is the results of it. If you look on the left, it's a stepped up purge. That means I'm plusing it. I'm increasing it. What do you notice about the pressure sensor? Okay, here's the thing. You're looking for results. It depends on the car. One thing I can be sure of is if I change the fuel trim, as you mentioned earlier, whoops. If I change the fuel trim, I can see it in my O2. But you have to be careful of, some of the manufacturers, if you do this, they won't change short-term fuel trim. I said O2, they won't change fuel trim. Because it's a set test they're doing, they won't compensate for it. But if you do see, you can also, depending on the car, see fuel trim change. What do you know about the system flow? Is it working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you got this on some of your cars. They'll let you do multiple tests, but they won't let you do it with the engine running. Okay? That's not uncommon. They won't let you do the solenoid test with the engine running. Okay? On the slide before? Yeah. Fuel trim, uh, you need to do the response to correct itself quicker than on the one on the left. Oh, on here? Yeah. On the O2? Yeah, with the newer cars, they correct themselves oh. real fast. Uh, this was off this was off of 2018. Long term. Is this on 18? Because a lot of times it'll correct so quick it's insane. Oh yeah, but I you mean on the long term you're talking about well, shorter. You're looking at the scan tool, you'll see it go up and then yeah, you get, a, you get changed, that's what you're looking for. But my point on this one was to know that sometimes they won't allow the fuel trim to change because you're doing a set test. So they won't change this result, but you can definitely see here that something happened. I'm just saying, beware, know what scan tool you're on, but know what car you're on. That's more important. It's not the scan tool, it's the car. And then on this one, oops, just a reminder that some of your cars, they won't let you do your solenoid testing. But some of you may have been around GM, and GM was great for purge and seal. Uh, with the engine running, and then you got some manufacturers that won't let you do those tests with the car running. You're just actively operating the, the solenoids. That's all you're doing. So be aware of that. So let's look at this one. Any issues with this one? No change. No change. Mm -hmm. No, 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 nothing to, nothing to monitor. This, is perfect. this vehicle got me down here. Runs great. <laughs> Remember, I told you to be careful on your eval systems and the unit values on mobile. Now, watch when I take the same car and I go to OEM. Oops. See the difference? Because also Nissan doesn't give you a pressure to give you voltage, but be careful on the global cars with Pascals. Okay. I'd rather see them use kilopascal than millimeters of mercury or inches of water column. You see the change quicker. But my point was to show you, be careful. Because I'm looking at, remember, I teach you as teachers. You got to do this to your students. You go out and do this demo in a class, that question marks on your face, too, when the student asks. Hey, no problem. Let's go take a look. And sure enough, it's working. It's working fine. Got to be careful. Remember, there's no absolute, the only absolute in this is never, always, and never, never. It's hard to get them to go back and forth between the generic. Oh, yeah, especially on Nissan, because when you get a Nissan, you got a system call that takes, da -da. it's not as bad as getting in the hot and doing an all uh, code search. <laughs> you know, you're going to have lunch to come back. Nissan, every time you leave, it's got to come back in and do a system call. Then you got to go into each menu to see what it has, and you can't get the vets only on those menus. So you got to be careful. My point here being is know your tool, know your car, but know your unit of measurement for the pressure. And Pascal's on global OB2 to me is not a good choice. Can you scope purge solenoids? Uh, purge solenoids? Sure you can. You can do it. You can do it just like any other because if the current ramping time is too slow, if the purge doesn't open long enough, what's going to happen to the, what codes are going to set probably? Slow, it doesn't open all the way, 
Is set a flow code or a leak code? We'll set a leak code because there's not enough pull down in the tank. It says, hey, I told the perps to open. I only reached this level of vacuum. I didn't get down here. I only reached here. I must have a leak. And it's a restricted perch. Mechanically, it's dying. There's another way you can see it. Oops. <clears throat> now, obviously, grafting is not, grafting can be limited. Depends on the car, depends on the speed of update, refresh rate. But this is a solenoid, a middle solenoid on a Toyota, which we're going to close with the case study on this when we're done. And you notice the command up here with the BSV is nice and clean. You notice down here the solenoid here, the middle solenoid, the commands are clean. But look at about the actual pressure change in the system. This is solenoid, it's on or off. What do you notice? It's inconsistent. It's sticky. This is sticky. And if you've ever done these, and they're in the middle of the car, up over the rear, uh, the rear, uh, not axle, axle per se, fixed axle, but I mean, uh, that tank thing. they're way up there. They're even hard to change because they're hard to get your hands up in there and get that little Phillips screw out of there. You don't want to be sticking a scope up there. But we're gonna, I'm gonna pull this one together in the before and after fix at the end. This is the one we looked at earlier. I'm kind of giving it to you in bits. But right here, right here is telling me, even in my scan tool, there's something going on with that solenoid and it's switching. Okay, because even though it's commanded and it's changing, the pressure shouldn't be doing it. Okay? Remember, I, this is the system I said, I'm looking at you guys for vacuum, you as a pressure. And this thing is not achieving its goal. Something's sticking. Again, this will be the one we will end with. I'll pull it all together. Okay, any questions on the, the manual testing, any of that stuff? Now we're to the point where maybe we want to pull out the smoke machine. We okay with that? Hey, when I got, I was hell happy in 94, I mean, uh, 2004, when my buddy Glenn Richardson from Star and Glider, I met him uh, through an ACAT conference, and man, he started pumping every smoke machine. So I was guilty as everybody else. Man, let's get these cars out there. Let's test them all for smoke. Then I got smarter and wiser to work with this thing. I said, you know what? It's not most of the problems. Most of the problems are component issues. And that's why I really started emphasizing this check the pressure sensor, check the solenoids. Use your smoke machine last. Mill is on. Verify that you have a leak ETC. Okay? And not even then. Remember, you learned today, weak vacuum means pressure sensor didn't see enough vacuum. It may still be a component. It may not be the gas cap. How do you see? Don't forget, there are TSBs out there. Um, isolate, preparing your system by sealing it, whatever you gotta do, we're gonna walk through that. Okay, uh, recommendation is use nitrogen. Uh, you might use a white light. There's other methods out there we're gonna talk about. UV dyes are in the smoke, the oil-based smoke for your uh, EVAP testers will leave traces, which we're gonna look at. And sometimes they leave puddles rather than traces. Prepare, verify, and run the test. Standard evap cart, I'm a big believer in the nitrogen bottles just for safety because if there is a leak, it gets out of the tank and there's a spark nearby, you got yourself a wick. Okay, and there are documented cases of fires from evap. Another tester uh, snap-on made, which was a good little unit. Uh, again, you're only putting a half PSI into the, uh, into the vehicle. Uh, the machines all step down, doesn't matter what you set. You can set your main gauge to anything, but you're, you're, it doesn't even matter what you set your main gauge to because the systems are all set for 0.5 PSI. Uh, whether you use nitrogen or not, you just gotta ask with standard practice, okay? In California, I was one of the ones that went to a bar meeting and just battered the hell out of them for not wanting, and initially telling you guys to use nitrogen. It doesn't mean we haven't done it with air, that we've been fortunate all these years, but the recommended practice is nitrogen. Nothing wrong with having a little ball there. Okay, the machine itself. First of all, look at my bottom one. Get rid of those freaking arrows. Okay, do not calibrate your machine. There's no need to do it. If it ain't the bottom, the car isn't fixed. Okay, and I'm gonna show you one where that happened. This particular car, I took the full case study up, and this particular car set a code because it has to code by the time 
hits, hits 40,000 of an inch. It can't code below that. This was a small leak on a car. If you use your smoke machine in your arrow, you're going to say you don't have a leak. Get rid of the arrows. Okay? Aim at the bottom, you're not happy because the PCM is not happy. Oops. What if we, oh, uh, service ports. Oops. But, and a lot of them have gone away. There's still some later model ones that happen. Uh, but as a whole, they've gone away. Okay? Um, what do we do? <coughs> Find access in another way. If you can get at the purge solenoid, you can get a hose off, go into the, go into the tank side. Test it that way. Yes, you're bypassing part of the system, but you get into it. You could also go through the gas cap, but I prefer you not doing that because there's more of a chance that we could be back there than right here. And you can isolate the purge yourself manually, try and test it yourself to see if it works or not. Okay? So make sure that's one of the ways to do it. We used to carry a little gauge set we'd have. You can go into the, kit, go into the system that way. We'd have a little gauge set we bought, an expensive one, where we could hook it up to that purge line, do that testing, and read our gauge. Uh, because service ports as a whole are gone, but there's still some floating around. And remember, service ports are left-hand threads if you're going to take the shredder valve out. And no, you can't take them out of a tire. Okay? They're too big. Uh, they're way too big. They'll fall. The tire ones will fall in. Okay, what about global OBD2? Mode 8. Number of ways you can close the vents on. Global OB2 will work on a number of cars. You can do the OEM side to close the vent. You can manually ground uh, the vent solenoid by just finding the ground side of the circuit, apply ground and hold it there for a little while, but please don't hold it too long because we'll overheat those things. Or I like good soft tires, at least for quick diagnosis. How many do relative compression tests? Okay, tell me, when you get set up, what do you do set up? How do you set it up? Tell me how you do your hookups. Somebody? A clamp meter? Okay. Amp meter on the ground? I'll grab the negative battery cable. Okay, so you get negative. Okay, and that's it? And then I'll pause if I get a number one solenoid. Okay. How hard sometimes to get number one? Okay. Let me ask you, and this is what I'm doing about a quick test. What if you just put the AFT probe on and crank the damn engine? Mm -hmm. The pattern looks good. Am I done? <coughs> Bingo. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's why I feel. So occasionally, if you got a leak in an e yeah, there you listen too. Oh, yeah. Well, we can still hear it, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but my, I, I'm not diminishing finding number one. Please don't. But I'm saying quickly, plant it, run it, look at it, pass or fail. Pinpoint it, now you go to number one. Well, the same thing here. If you're in doubt, pinch off pliers. Start working your way along. Where does the leak stop? If it stopped here, I'm going back over there. Because up to here, it's good. That's how you begin to split things down. Okay? Make it simple. Don't overthink it. So let's walk through this. This is mode 8. This happened to be on an O3 GM. It works. It closes the vent for me. It commands it on. Let's put it that way. But I have no way through my scanner on the global side to see if it actually worked. Now I could do this while I'm blowing smoke in the system. If I blow smoke in the system and the ball drops, what if it starts dropping? What does that tell you probably happened with the vent solenoid? Probably worked. Now, if you want to see pressure, there's something cool on this. Does anybody remember Nissan's 96, 97, 98, where they, even up to 2000, they had two diagnostic connectors? One was OE and one was global. Did you ever try hooking up two scandals in that car? <laughs> Coolest thing ever. That damn right it does because people don't realize there's a global side of the computer, and there's an OE side of the computer. If you ever want to show scan tool by uh, grafting a scan tool on O2 sensor, and you have one of those cars, get one of those cars, hook it up. It's cooler than ever. The global tool is doing this. And then you go to this OEM side on the same car with the scan tool hooked up, and it's doing this. It shows you the difference in refresh rate. EVAP does the same thing. So watch this one. This is still my GM, but I did something different. I closed the vent. I know I could close the vent on the GM side, but I wanted to show you a point that if you did do the vent, vent on global, you can do some things there, especially on can cars and watch the pressure because pressure's there. 
So I switched without turning the key off. I just backed out of global, went into GM. There are my pressure readings. 1.4, 1.5 is normal. I'm down at 1.18 with the key on. Vents closed. I know it's closed. I'm already in a pressure right now. It's building. I'm ready to learn something. Now, again, on a GM, I could have done this on the other side, but my point was to show you how you can combine it too. So I'm going to do it on another one. Does everybody see what I'm getting at there? Now, question, a per, uh, thing on this that I want to emphasize. When you use mode 8 global bidirectional, it is not bidirectional. It's a request to turn on the vents only. It's the only one. Once you turn it on, there's only one way to turn it off. You've got to turn the key off and wait about 10 seconds. The scan tool cannot command it off. You have to turn the key off to exit the test. The scan tool is not bidirectional. We'll request, request it on once per key cycle, turn the key off. That's it. So here's a Honda. And I decided again to show you on this one. I already did the Honda on Global 8, uh, Mode 8. Then I went in and I captured the pressure starting to build. You know Honda is 2.5 is normal. When I switched over to the OE side, by the time I got over there, look what was already starting to happen with the vent on. It's already starting to build. Then when I open the vent, what happens to pressure? They dropped it down. So you can use mode 8. Now let's look at it on the can car. System that says e -block test op, uh, leak test is successful. But notice, there's that. It's zero, because that ain't given enough time. It may not have enough problem. It may be too cool, because it's an open system. But you can use mode 8. And if you got a Ford, this works great. Always works on a Ford. So don't be afraid to use global. If you use your smoke machine, you want to close the back door, try mode 8. Good tool. But it won't work on everything. OK, we got the smoke machine hooked up. And it says, upon initial, always leave the vent closed initially. The ball rises to the top. That tells you there's no restrictions in the system. The ball drops rapidly to the bottom. There's a restriction in the system because you haven't closed the vent yet. Make sure it flows first. And I'll show you why we're going to do that. I think I got that next in the case study. Oh, just a little, a couple things here as a reminder. For smoke machines. System open. System closed. That's simple. That's not my hand, that's Dan Narmichi's. My brother from a different mother. Okay, let's do the other one. Let's look at restriction, what it might look like. We're going to see anyway, but watch. He's going to zoom in again here. I think he does. Notice, it should never happen that fast. If that ball drops down that fast, I don't care how full the tank, it should never drop that fast. You got restriction. So what might that look like? Okay, so once we close the back door, then that ball should start to drop if there's no leaks present. If you want to and you can't control the vent, then use your pinch off pliers. Buy that fresh air hose and use those pinch off pliers. Time is money. Best pinch off pliers, obviously your bar uh, e valves pinch off pliers are great. Don't use the red ones. I've never seen those clamp the hose good enough for what I want. Okay, they'll still have a leak inside. The fuel line pliers, the only problem those, the third one, is the jaws aren't long enough in some cases for the hose, but generally those will work too because they are rounded. Buy strips, people say, I don't use that. Nah, the hell, those work great. How many times are you really in the customer, that life of that car, going to cripple them with a pair of buy strips like that? One time, oh, by the way, I have to clarify because you guys who came to my instructor summer the workshops those summers, I did have one instructor who decided that on a Ford he could pinch the uh, plastic lines. <laughs> okay, so please, hey, hey, how many students you have that might do that? Remember, don't forget that. So, this is a great tool for quickly isolating down the system. Remember on your service ports, no more than PSI, but all your machines are set to 0.5. Let the smoke blow so you know it's blowing. And if it's a Toyota, generally this is on the uh, service port, 
you got the fresh air hose, there's a yellow line up there that you got to clamp off, and I'll show you why. Remember earlier we said that Toyota could cool into a vacuum? Toyota, in reality, was the first natural vacuum leak detection system we had. Because whether I was this system, this system, or this system, where I'm looking at you guys and open all, what did I say should happen on a Toyota when I turn the key on, engine off, if the car's been sitting for a while? It's probably going to be in a vacuum. But how could that be? The vent's always open. The purge is closed, but the vent's always open. This is the little valve in the back of the canister called the air drain. And that is the valve that is mechanically closed and normally closed. And the only time it opens up is when you fill the system up or you pull a vacuum on the system. So when you pressurize, what happens is it, it pushes that little valve open to push the air to the atmosphere. When you smoke test every Toyota, guess what you do to that valve? What's the rating on it? What's the smoke machine rating? 0.5. That's why you have to clamp off the hose on the Toyotas. That's the valve though, when it's off, it's normally closed. So guess what it does to the system when the engine's off? It seals it. So that's why in a Toyota, you turn that key on, let's say you're using millimeters of mercury uh, at 762 atmosphere. If this thing is down in the 750s or down in the 740s, yay, there's no leak. It's been in a vacuum. Try this on, just take the cap and loosen it, cap, loosen it up. It'll go up the atmosphere, close the cap with the car running, and watch, it'll start to pull down. You don't have to have it running, just turn it and give it a little time and you'll start to see it build a little bit or cool a little bit. It's this down here and that's why in the previous diagram, well, you can see it here. There's typically a yellow line right here, and that's why you have to clamp it on the Toyotas, because you are pushing that valve open to the smoke machine. But if that valve's good, the engine's be holding the vacuum and the engine's off. It could be a pressure for a while, but it will be into a vacuum the next morning. Okay? And that's on the back of all of them. There's the clamping, and this is an early picture. This is, I put this in there should have changed it, but I just want to say, you can see how that hose. You really think you can clamp that hose tight enough, those clamps? No way, no how. Now, if you get into Toyota and you see there's a rubber nipple up there, you must remove the rubber nipple and plug it to this side of the hose. Otherwise, the smoke will come out of it. Now, why do you remove it? That hose is the fresh air hose to the top of the pressure sensor, the atmospheric side. If you don't remove it, you're putting equal pressure on both sides of the diaphragm. Okay, you'll never find a leak. So you open it up the atmosphere so the sensor can move and you pressurize the system. Okay, so you plug, you remove the hose from the air drain here, cap it off, leave that open. If you see smoke coming out of that, you're buying a new canister because the valve is no, the valves internally are shot. They're leaking. If you don't do it, the diaphragm's gonna stay stuck. You're talking just the small vacuum line on top of the little pot? Yep, right to this air drain hose. Yeah. Pop it off, put a nipple on it. Okay. What I used to do with the pinch off pliers, I still leave a rubber nipple on there. When we're doing the toes, so everybody knew you're gonna do that. Look for this. Now, some of them are just vented to the atmosphere where they're located, you don't have to do this. That nipple won't be there. Yeah. But if it is there, you must remove it. So you'll never find a leak because the air, Smoke will just keep going around the system. Okay, here's another picture of the drain valve. Now, if you have a later system, what happens in this drain valve when you go ahead and pull? Because one thing I didn't say to you on this one, I should go back a second. Remember the early system that looked at these guys and those guys? I look at you guys for vacuum, you guys for pressure but I can't identify the size of a leak, and I can't pull a vacuum on the whole system. It doesn't work. But on the later model systems, here's what happens. Because if I pull a vacuum on the system, let me take this out of there. If I pull a vacuum on the system, that valve will open and I'll be sucking air in. I can't seal it off to do a vacuum check. On this one, what happens is, 
when you close the vent, you pull this valve open so you can draw all the way up to the vent. Anybody had people do service on these air filters and leave the hose off, the vent's on the right there? Okay? You need the vent line to leak check the system. When the purge opens up, this is valve up to pull the vacuum in on this line. So again, look at this diagram here. I think I have it in there in detail. Yeah. What's missing on this line? No vent. You say, how can it be sealed if it has vent? Because of that valve. But if you open that valve, you still can't draw a vacuum on the system because there's, nothing, there's no back door. These systems didn't have to be as complicated as they were. And you can repair them to a degree. Okay, uh, let's see what we got there. How are we doing? I think we're doing good. We're going to be done plenty of time. The vent's line open, apply smoke to the system until it comes out. If it does not come out, the fuel level could be too high. The bypass solenoid could be in the middle of the system blocking it. A blockage might be present somewhere in the system, and a leak detecting machine may not be working. Don't forget that. Okay, so here's an example, and this is what I like about the couple of the newer machines. They have flow detectors. Because sometimes, think about a 20,000 of an inch lane. You're pushing the smoky oil through there. If you push too much volume, what might it do to that seal, that hole? Plug it up. So, what they allow you to do is reduce the flow. And Staplon made this machine, and I have one, and it works pretty well. But this is a good example of showing you. Did you know? Eight out of the top ten emissions DTCs can be diagnosed with smoke detection technology. Whoa. Introducing the Smart Smoke oh, see it Evaporative so Emissions Tester from Snap-On. Smart Smoke self-calibrates smokes and tests. Smart Smoke can be well, powered show you by this, any Snap-On 14 or 18 volt power tool battery or off the vehicle battery. Okay. Well, it accepts okay. shop air or any inert gas. OEM specified nitrogen or CO2. And it comes with a step saving wireless That's remote control. They have remote control. It's so much to low flow. Better isolating the leak. This is what I want to show you. Or use it with Ultra Trace UV dye. Measure vacuum or pressure in inches of water columns. They didn't have the old red light cameras. From two locations at the same time. Those, they work. Uh, a smart smoke detects yeah, many types of smoke. leaks. Uh, you can die then. One unit, many ways of getting it. Come and it's all backed by a three-year warranty and this tip long past that. Live phone help. Well, I want to get to on this one. I should have added a little bit more. Let me pull this Find up. Those leaks quickly. I want to get to the part that shows you the low flow here. See the beauty of video? Okay, so here we go. The smart smoke defaults to 20 thousandths. The standard for model year 2000 and newer vehicles. Push the button to change it to 40 thousandths for 1999 and older cars. Get rid of that Push too. it a third time to switch to 10 thousandths. This is a no future setting. That. The third button is the start five minute switch. Push this button to start the five minute test. I want to get to the flow one. I mean, I should have just added it down to that, but I didn't. So hold on a second. We'll get there. I want to see where it's pulsing. Probably the end. Is that off Snap-on's website? Yeah, the machine I think is still available. Where'd it go? Maybe I screwed up and hit Push the, the display. I have a couple of these. And what it was supposed to do, and I think I picked the wrong video. Gas I apologize. I apologize. What it's supposed to do is you'll actually see it when you put on pulse mode. <clears throat> Instead of pushing it all the time, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling, it's releasing, pulling back. So it's the idea is to release the pressure through that small hole. Okay, so remember, if you keep applying full smoke to that, you might actually seal it. I think I put the wrong one in there. I gotta fix that. Well, that okay. makes it easier, because like, if you're looking at a confined space, um, it's filling everything with smoke. So with the pulse, it kind of gives you a better isolation. Yep. And it all depends on where the leak is. So again, most of the smoke machines came, came with some kind of light, but the one I want to show you on the bottom is, Depend on the size of the leak. Sometimes you won't see smoke. You see where they puddle. So sometimes you're not going to find the smoke. You got to feel around and look for wetness. Okay? That's why I saved that one there. You can see the dye, but there was no smoke there. Soap and water. Yeah. 
Oh, we used to do that for years, just spray it around. Now we got CO2 and dyes, and I've added some of that stuff in, but yeah, no different than we've done before. That was my point, was just be aware of that. That was a uh, vacuum cut valve on a Nissan, and it set that 0 .030 leak earlier I showed you, that was under the 0 .040 calibration, that one set leak. But again, that's what we got from it, cognitive rather than actual vapor. I had a Toyota like that. Took us two weeks. To, I had a Toyota like that. Took us two weeks to find. Yeah, pay attention and just. We, we found. And there's other tools to use, yeah. but yeah, sometimes you got to feel around. Yeah, that's where it's like it. Yeah, we used to. Just a quick review here again on normal operation. That solenoid's yeah. on. Purge is yeah. working. We're pulling a vacuum. We're getting inches of mercury. I mean, inch, well, this one says inches of mercury, but uh, we know we're pulling out a small amount. How about this one here? Any issues with this? Well, that stuff's coming through the push phone now. Okay, I hope you guys can see that, okay. Okay, let me do this. I only need part of this. See, vent is off, purge is commanded on, and it's staying at 2.5 volts. Be a, be a teacher here. Front. The birch? Front carry out. Okay. The command's there. I know. So, was it? Do we know? Can carry it out? No. Yeah. This one had a restriction. Also, you can have solenoids that just because the command's, remember, you're grafting the command, you're not grafting the actual movement of the solenoid. That's the other thing with your grafting tools. Be careful. The newer ones are faster. They're much better than they ever were. But pay attention that that's just a command. We don't know if it was Eric should carry out. That's desired. Yeah, that's desired. <laughs> so in this case, there was a restriction on the other side of the purge, and uh, it was working. Also, those purge always do, do heat up, and then they do fail. This one was actually working. I had graphs of it before it was working, and all of a sudden, it stopped working. So pay attention to that, too. Toyota? No, this was a Nissan. We've had a few sticky ones on those, especially vents. Uh, this was the old uh, vacuum uh, uh, smoke wizard <laughs> CO2 cartridges. You can use those for getting around in the place where you don't have airlines accessible. Charge those up. Probably have to give blood to get them charged up. Don't forget this. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the original sniffer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And those stinger probes, they'll get up in the tight places above tanks and stuff. You're just trying to find out if you've got hydrocarbons up in there or CO2, depending on the situation. Okay. You push your hydrocarbon, but you can also find your CO2. You can find a gas tank or a pump. In our case, it's small, but it's not close enough to the... Yeah, I mean, it's, a lot of people aren't using gas analyzers anymore. Now, I'm not going to go to all these, but I'm going to show them to you because some of you know, a lot of you know Bernie. He's got his... I, you know, I can't, that's right, I'm not set up here to go. Um, that's okay. He's got his bullseye trading where basically he's putting CO2 in the system, and then he shoots his stuff on it where the leaks are. Uh, I did not have one in the college before I left, but he is in the process of shipping me one so I can do some research with my own, on my own with it uh, to see how effective it is. I think everything I've done up to now with EVAP has been fine. I haven't needed that. But I'm going to play with it because I don't want to say no, but he's shipping me one next week to play with. Um, and uh, that site there, he's got a lot of training stuff. I don't know how many get Bernie's stuff, but he's got some good training stuff on there. You just got to be able to listen to Bernie for hours. I love Bernie, but don't get me wrong. Okay, here's one. Simple isn't always simple. This is on the rear side of the canister. The car came in with a PO440 455. Here's to be simple. Got cracked toes back there. Okay? Feeling pretty good about this in a moneymaker. <laughs> Apply the smoke, ball drops to the bottom. And guess what isn't coming out that crack? <laughs> smoke coming out that crack. Not simple, not so simple anymore. <laughs> oh, How much water is that thing sucked in? Oh, <laughs> uh, remember I told you the Nissans? This was one of those that was buried down at an angle. You don't have to go off roading. We're just driving on. And you get you get a good enough puddle, you might get some, but my point here being yeah, water's been getting in there. Yeah. This one not, yeah, it was easy. Ready to get freezing and cold climates? Yeah. 
Yeah, because the charcoal doesn't like any kind of condensation in there. So that'll turn to mud. But this one, yeah, well, the easy thing would be to go get a uh, canister, go get some new hoses. There's only one problem. I said the smoke dropped rapidly to the bottom. The canister's in the back of the car. Uh-oh. What happened to this stuff when the fuel line's going forward? It sucked it all up. It, it, it lines all the way. It lines all the way to the front. Wow. Yeah. That's how bad this has gotten. My point on this whole thing is, guys, we all get burned with this. Car comes in. We're going to the end. That's a money maker. But no smoke coming out of that. Ball drops to the bottom quickly. We got a whole other set of problems here. Right. Okay. And this was not a simple one because by the time he got done, he wound up on his uh, lines he needed. It was not a cheap job. To put in so I'm trying to say to you is the visual looks easy because we know what is, what's that one of there's one going around on Facebook that bolt that you know that little bolt that cost you uh, three days something to that effect a lost bolt or that bolt broken bolt that cost you three days of work that was my point in this one I thought it was a great one for a case study okay ball drops immediately to the bottom we got an issue there's the there's the end result okay when you get done with the smoke machine do yourself a favor. Don't just walk away. Monitor it for a while. Make sure the ball stays at the bottom. This point here would blip. Okay? It would be easy to say, hit the bottom, I'm done. But watch there for a while. It blipped. It blipped. This was on a Honda. Here's what we got. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay? <clears throat> so, when you're doing the smoke machines, give us some time once it hits bottom. Don't just... You know, the machines will run for about five minutes. Let them run for a while. Make sure they're staying at the bottom. Okay, once they time out, they'll jump. But this car here, I wish I could have videoed it. I didn't do it at that time. And the ball was just going, boop, boop, boop. That's all it was. Can you see that with the digital one? What's that? Why don't you see that drop with the digital one? Because uh, there's a saying where you can put it on pressure. And it holds the pressure if you see it. The decay, yeah, yeah, it does have, you're right. It does have, you have a decay mode. It's possible, yeah. Well, it would be the same thing here. You saw it on this. You saw it jumping. What you wouldn't see is, you still wouldn't see where the leak was. Yeah. So the digital would have changed like this, but you wouldn't have seen where it was. What we'd finally have to do is just go back and inspect and say, this is something small. And sure enough, here it was. Okay, a great test car for the class. Okay. Now, let's finish up with this case study. It's the last one we got to do. Remember, we, we already hit on this, but I want to pull, we've kind of done bits and pieces with this one. This is a system that says, you guys are vacuum, you guys are pressure. By the way, in this class, the videos for this system are there. They show you through a scan tool exactly what's going on when the test is running. A bunch of these things are supported with video. I just didn't have time today. We've been through this. We've been through that where we split the system, okay? This is the bypass solenoid in the middle of the system that separates the tank from the canister. So you're either reading the canister pre uh, vacuum or you're reading tank pressure. You can see through here there's no way for vacuum to get to the can uh, tank. So it's an either or situation. So this is the one that we had, and there it is to the uh, tank side. And I said to you earlier, if you're ever getting smoked out of any of the hoses, one of the things is these di that diaphragm up there actually has an atmospheric port. When that diaphragm goes, you'll actually get smoke coming out of the top of that valve. If the top of that valve is bleeding smoke, or this valve is bleeding smoke, you're replacing the canister. Other than that, you shouldn't have to replace the canister. This is the one I showed you earlier. This was the uh, 06 information for that vehicle. Did you put the right one in there? No, that's, I put the wrong one in there. Now, you remember earlier that solenoid? Look at the middle one, the pressure readings. As we switch from tank to canister, Remember the ones up there, the ones that were all broken up there? This is the bad one. See how they're doing? Now let's look at the good one when the solenoid got replaced. 20 bucks. Look at the solenoid activity on the top line of that white box. And this is through a scan tool. This is without a lab scope. This uses a scan tool in the front seat of the car, with the self driving the car while the solenoid is operating. And again, the beauty of Snap-on is, it's recording all the time. I put the kids up there. When I got enough on the screen, I just hit the disk, save it, transfer it over to shop stream, as I mentioned, if you ordered it here yesterday, 
you're teaching and you have Snap-on and you're not using ShopStream, go get it. Snap-on Diagnostics, it's free. You put in the PC and you make these kind of graphs. And you'll spend a lot of time moving around things around. You can reorder them and stuff. But look at the difference in the solenoid up there versus up there. Remember, this is pressure we're looking at. And look at the difference in them. Before, after. This didn't take long. It took me probably longer to get rid of that little freaking screw on the top of the, you know, and the, by the solenoid, get my fingers up in to get that little screw out of there, and it didn't do anything else. Then I get the damn screw back in the new solenoid. <laughs> it took longer than it did diagnose. Okay? And there's the pass value. If it's a solenoid, typically 255 is a number because it's an either or. And there's the good one when the monitor ran. Uh, this is the monitor class I always tell you. If it's a monitor, most of your monitors are done in 15 minutes. Well, on this system of either or, vacuum or pressure, this one took about 40 mile drive and about 40 minutes from my side of the bay to the other side of the bay to finish up the EVAP monitor because what it's looking for is if the system's really working, yeah, I can get a vacuum from you guys, but I have to drive it long enough to build up one on your side. That took 45 minutes. That's not normal. Okay? But a simple solenoid, $20 solenoid, using mode 6, that quickly. We find no problem. Okay? Monitor's complete. No codes. Okay, any last questions? Any last questions? I know I got stickers for you. Hopefully, I have enough. We have enough. What was that? What was that? 2011? What's that? So this is what out of the 2011 or the 09 or the 011? You mean uh, the course? It was UT007 that I wrote in 2012 and 13. There is a uh, EVAP update, bar update, that a lot of the stuff was just from also. Oh, bar update? Maybe not, maybe I'm getting here mixed up with the bar update. No, no. Oh, oh, no. In 2007, Myron and myself put together a book. It has some of this in it. Uh, Jerry Trucoli had a book, six book, and Dr. Smog had his own book. And we were part of the Education Advisory Committee back then. We saw the two pieces of material and we said, this isn't acceptable. So we put together that book. And in there was also field trip that I wrote and EVAP. What I did for 2012 is I took it and totally expanded into what the original course was. And now I've expanded it into this new stuff. And I still have, this goes with it. This is what goes with the course. This is the textbook that goes with the course. And that's the one we've trained 5,800 5, people. So UT007 is still alive, but I want to say to you again, and I'm not here, I don't come here to sell it, but it is available if you're teaching EVAP. I'm sorry, you can go into any freaking textbook out there. How much do they cover on EVAP? And as you finish, as you finish the first paragraph, you're getting excited, and then they move on to the next topic. So if you're looking to expand your EVAP knowledge and you want to do a unit on it, this is a 16-hour unit. You can stretch it out as much as you want. Test bank, labs, the whole works. If you're a bar school that hasn't used it yet, it's available. The whole thing with uh, shipping, except for tax, if you're taxable, it's $32.95. And, and the, disc has, the disc has every slide that relates to the book, tells you what page that slide goes to in the book. And most of them have instructor notes that you have to read. Remember I said earlier today, oh, I write it for you. If you're not comfortable teaching, the class is worthless. So you have to be comfortable teaching. I had someone ask me a few years back, Rick, why does it want to go to school? They don't, this is back in this classroom. Why they don't want my materials? They want yours. I said, it's very simple. You've got technical stuff that you haven't written for the instructors. If you as instructors aren't comfortable teaching, it's worthless. You're just regurgitating something you're not comfortable with. This class is comfortable for you. What I really want to do on this was just say to you, let's not overdo EVAP, but let's get away from smoke machines. Let's get organized in our thought process and let's understand the systems. And don't always go for smoke. Think of how the system works. EVAP monitors do run. They do identify problems. But you gotta focus in on what you're doing. Any last questions? Is there any supposed to have an EVAP the No, no. So Back when it, when I, so this is wrong. No, no. No, uh, they emailed back when AOL had, when I started with AOL, 
they only allowed you so many letters, and I decided to put the first initial and take off the last letter on the E. Oh, okay. So it is Escalombre without the E on the end for the AOL. Okay. Please, feel, feel free to email me, say you're in my workshop, and I'll get back to you. I, I, know, I know I will. Absolutely I will. won't be home for a few days, but I will help you out. I'm here to help you as instructors. That's why I'm here. Nothing more, nothing less. I want you to be able to do your job more effectively. I've done the work for you on this part. Now I need you to get comfortable for it and teach your students the right way to handle this stuff. And if you do, I think you'll be happy campers. Uh, again, if our instructors looking for a course down the road, it's still available, it's not outdated, it's still relevant. And uh, for you that are doing this in an engine performance class or something, admissions class, it's a standalone unit. And it's thorough. I just want to see people continue to learn this stuff and learn it the right way. Because the textbooks that are out there don't teach us stuff. And as you guys were with me yesterday, there ain't no textbook of all the videos. 